right, it is uh, 6.05 p.m. July 27th, 2021, and I call this meeting to order. We have six or seven members here, so we have a quorum, and um, if there's any additions or modifications to the agenda, I'll take a motion for that now. I'd actually like to do one um, quick modification, which is to have a discussion about uh, where future meetings will be, as well as if we can have a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I second that. All in favor of the, uh, the amendment to the agenda, raise your hand to say aye. 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 I believe that passes unanimously. Um, <clears throat> uh, we'll put that in on, we'll make that agenda item 5.06. And uh, I motion that we ad uh, adopt the amended agenda as is. I'll take a second. Second. Second by Susie. All in favor, raise your hand to say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Um, next on the agenda is approval of the minutes from 5-27-21, which is the first NACOL session. Um, my so-called move to ad uh, adopt. Yeah. Sorry. Do you want a motion on all six? Do you want, I'll move for all, that we approve all six sets of minutes. All right, uh, I amend that up. So, I uh, motion that we approve the minutes from all six previous meetings. Um, 527, 610, 615, 617, 622, and 77. Second. Seconded by Shireen. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 <clears throat> that passes unanimously. Moves us on to agenda item 3.01, which is public forum. At this point in time, uh, if, no, if there's anybody in the public that would like to um, speak, you're welcome to come to the, um, to the table here and um, speak. Good evening. Hi. I'm uh, Jeff Nick. I'm chair of the Church Street Marketplace Commission. Um, I've joined some of your Zoom meetings over the past uh, few months, and um, I'm here because I and my fellow commissioners and many of them, many, most of the merchants and their employees are very concerned about public safety. Um, it is a great concern, um, so much so that our staff conducted a survey amongst our members um, and the merchants and their, and their um, employees. Forty-two percent of those surveyed felt unsafe at night. Only, only 6% felt safe. These are shocking numbers. 51% of those in the survey was a victim of a crime um, in the past 12 months. Whether that was shoplifting, damage to their vehicle, rocks thrown through a window, um, sexual harassment, things of those nature. This, these are shocking numbers. And, you know, we're very concerned. Um, so much so that the Burlington Business Association has rolled out a program, an escort service for those who are afraid to walk to their car after a shift at night. We've rolled out a service. They're <coughs> advertising, they're looking for donations. They're going to get $15,000 in about a week because all of us on Church Street are very, very concerned <clears throat> about what's going on. Um, our beautiful City Hall Park has been inundated with bad behavior. I mean, open alcohol containers all day long. It is shocking what we're allowed to happen out there. Kids are trying <clears throat> to enjoy this beautiful pop jet fountain, and the families look in shock at what they can see with just beer, unbelievable amounts of beer out there. And we let it happen. We do have an open container ordinance in effect. We could easily ask our police force to do something about it. They used to, they used to dump the alcohol out. No longer, for many reasons. Probably there's not enough political will, not here, but elsewhere in the city, that they don't feel compelled to do it anymore. Plus they don't have the resources since they've been the uh, cuts. 
As simple as it is, if you eliminate the alcohol in that park and on Church Street and in the alleyways and on the side streets, the people who shouldn't be drinking, and quite frankly, many of them have problems, and we're enabling them by allowing them to drink, to just drink their self into oblivion sometimes. I walk down the street, and there's an ambulance on my way here. And the guy who was intoxicated refused to get in the ambulance. The officers couldn't do anything about it. Meanwhile, folks are trying to enjoy a dinner out there in a little rain in the cafe, and there's arguments and, and uh, close to a fight going on right on the corner of Bank Street and Church Street. I mean, this is, happens on a regular basis. And it's, it's something we have to do something about. Um, and if you eliminate the alcohol, I believe that so many things will follow, such as the public urination and defecation, we see that, sexual harassment of women reported a number of times, fighting, the litter and debris that's left behind up and down Church Street, out in the park, it's incredible. Vomiting, I mean, we have, shop owners have to clean this stuff up. It's amazing, and I've been in this city for a long time, and this is the worst I've ever seen it. So I'm shocked that there isn't a greater sense of urgency amongst all the city leaders, I really am. But something has to be done, and I hope we figure it out soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, anybody else from the public that would like to speak for public forum? You're welcome to do so now. Um, with that, I close public forum and uh, move on to agenda item 4.01, which is the introduction of the new data analyst. Stetson. I am now the senior policy and data analyst at the Office of City Planning here. Um, and as for the past three or so years, I have done the data analysis for the police department, but I am passing along those duties to uh, Jono Larson, who is here with us. Um, We're really excited to have Jono on our team. Um, he just received his PhD in biostatistics from Harvard. But he also grew up in Burlington, he went to BHS, and he's, he's now back here, and he has a keen interest in policing. So we're excited to see um, what's next for this work. Hi, I'm sorry, John, could you repeat your last name? Larson, L-A-R-S-O-N. Thank you. Could you have it back in town? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's any uh, questions at all for uh, Mr. Larson, but that would be the time. So welcome, Mr. Larson, excited to have you. Will you be, um, um, Nancy did a report for us uh, a couple months ago, I believe it was, an annual report. Will you be doing any data analysis in the interim or will you be focusing on doing the annual report for us next April? Um, I will be doing the annual report next April and in the interim, I imagine I'll be doing lots of data analysis both for, with regards to police data and then other data analysis for the city. My official title is city data analyst. So. Is city data analyst? Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, any further questions? Just a welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Awesome. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you. Likewise. Nancy, thanks for everything you've done for us. Yeah. Of course. Um, and uh, with that, it moves us. Okay. Um, good points. Uh, so we have a time certain um, agenda item, 5.01, and that's six minutes away. And I feel, do you, uh, I don't think you have, six minutes probably is not long enough for the chief support, I assume? It may be. Uh, Maybe. I'm going to try to keep it short until the point. All right, oh, in that case, um, yeah, we'll move on to agenda item 4.02, the chief's report. All right, so as a summary of incidents from June 1st to June 30th, BPD handled 2,070 incidents over that time period. 
three aggravated assaults, 13 burglaries, 15 disorderly conduct incidents, 125 disturbance incidents, 52 domestic disturbance incidents, two domestic assault felonies, two domestic assault misdemeanors, one attempted homicide, 55 intoxication incidents, 20 larceny from a building incidents, 41 larceny from motor vehicle incidents, 38 larceny other, four lewd and lascivious conduct incidents, 92 mental health issues, six missing persons, 80 noise complaints, nine overdose incidents, 19 retail thefts, one robbery, two search warrants that were related to domestic violence. Our domestic violence prevention officer executed both of those search warrants, four sex assaults, one stalking incident, 10 stolen vehicles, three suicide attempts, 186 suspicious incident events, 82 de trespass incidents, 10 TRO, FRO violations, which are restraining order violations, six untimely deaths, 21 vandalism incidents, 112 welfare checks, and 66 total arrests. So out of those arrests, the majority of them are most likely citations. I'm not sure exactly the breakdown between citations and lodgings um, out of that number, but 66 total arrests. And that summarizes the, the incidents that we dealt with over the course of June. And I just briefly wanted to touch on our staffing level and where we were at a year ago and where we're headed uh, in the future. And I, I would certainly welcome the police commission's uh, collaboration in trying to address some of these issues that we're facing. Uh, so last year, prior to Chief Morrison leaving, we were at 92 <coughs> officers. We are currently at 75 or negative 17 officers. With that, I believe you're gonna hear later this evening, um, or I should say in addition to that, there are at least 10 to 11 that we know who are planning on leaving within the next year. These are both retirements and resignations. In addition to that, the BPOA recently did a survey, and my understanding is they're gonna provide some more information on that later in this meeting that indicated, and they did not include the deputy chiefs or the chief of police in this, or the acting chief of police, I should say, but 31 officers are actively looking for employment elsewhere currently. Um, so where are we at right now? We are at, again, 75 officers on the books. That's 57 officers, both in uniform and the detective bureau. That is three deputy chiefs, one who is the acting chief of police, one acting deputy chief, and myself. We have five lieutenants and 10 sergeants. Now out of those 57 officers, it's important to, to recognize that not all of them are available. We have, I believe, three on long-term injury right now and three on military leave. Also by contract, we have to have 10 people assigned to the detective bureau, which is where we are currently at. Additionally, we have one sergeant assigned to the airport and seven police officers, and that is bare minimum staffing at the airport. So out of those numbers, out of the 75, that gives you the breakdown. So where we are going, if, well, I, let, me, let me add a little, a little more context. We looked back at staffing for the fall tour of 2019. We had 45 officers in uniform assigned to answer calls for service. During that time period, during the fall tour, September through December, we took 8,890 calls for service. If you just divide the number of officers into those calls for service, that's 198 <coughs> calls for service per officer over that time period. For this coming fall, September through December, we are anticipating uniform officer staffing at 29 officers. Now, if we take the number of incidents that we responded to in June and apply that over four months, it would mean that we will respond to 8,280 calls for service over the course of the fall tour in 2021. This means that each of those officers will handle 286 incidents or an approximate increase of 44%. In addition to that, we've, we've looked at data recently that just that shows that over the three years prior, we were averaging around seven hours of overtime per day. And over the last approximately 70 plus days, we have averaged close to 15 hours per day in overtime. And to drive this point home, officers are being ordered over on a regular basis. This is not always voluntary. And for example, one of our officers this morning who was held over ended up falling asleep behind the wheel and, and crashing his vehicle on his way home, damaging his vehicle. Thankfully, he was not injured. Um, where are we headed? 
trying to project, and it is difficult, a year from now, if we lose 10 officers, which I consider a best case scenario given the fact that we have 10 to 11 who have definitely said that they are leaving or retiring, we'll be at 49 officers a total between detectives and uniform. This will leave 31 officers in uniform to respond to calls. We anticipate the structure will be more or less the same, but we don't anticipate filling some of our supervisory positions. So we will have one acting chief or a new chief of police, two deputy chiefs, five lieutenants, and eight sergeants. This leaves 65 total, down from 75 where we're at currently. Worst case scenario, at least I'd like to think it's a worst case scenario, is we lose 20 officers to retirement and resignation. Now, this is not this is not outlandish, seeing as we just lost 17 over the course of the last year. If that happens, we will be at 55 total officers, which is a little, a little less than a 50% decrease in, in staffing from what I've experienced over the last 20 years at 105, 100. I think we average around 96 for the most part. <clears throat> we will have 21 available for uniform, assuming we keep the detective bureau, which we feel is very important because they investigate the most serious crimes, and we need to have the capacity to still do that and, and gain closure for victims. Out of that number, that's 39 total officers for the Detective Bureau and the airport, again, and USB, again, 21 to answer the calls. And at that point, and even coming into this fall tour, I almost feel like we're at the point where we realistically should, for the well-being of the agency, eliminate the midnight shift and we certainly will not be able to staff it if we are at 21 officers for the Uniform Service Bureau. Again, we'll have three DCs, most likely five lieutenants, although that number may get pared down also due to retirements, and eight sergeants. And again, because of our shift structure, we need supervision to stay at a certain level as far as supervising both day shift, evening shift, and midnight shifts on both sides of the schedule. So that's, uh, that's just a brief overview of, of where we're at, where we're at and, and where we're possibly going. Um, it's definitely something that I've struggled with for the past year. I know that, that I, um, I forwarded to the chair um, using the old formula that the Rutherford consultants used in 1990 and put real numbers to that. It, that formula, applying that formula that I, that I forwarded to you, and you can see the breakdown and see how that worked said that we should have 84 officers assigned to Uniform Services Bureau responding to calls for service. We are much lower than that currently and expect to be much lower than that in, within a year. And that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, if anyone has any questions uh, for the Chief, I ask that you put them on hold. Um, and we are going to jump to agenda item 5.01 and then return to 4.02. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, sorry for <laughs> yeah. um, Shay Totten and Vicki Crocker from, um, uh, she, Vicki is from the Vermont Family Network and Shay is uh, part of Mental Health First Burlington. Um, just to introduce this, uh, one of the issues that has become clear with regard to um, the challenges for the Burlington Police Department is the sharp increase in the number of mental health calls. And uh, that, those number, that number of calls has increased, has doubled from 2012 to 2019 from like 450 a year to 900 a year. As many of you know, CNA, a consulting firm, is doing a functional assessment of the police department and uh, will be reporting in September on what their recommendation is with regard to staffing levels. Um, but one of the things that they have been asked to consider is alternatives. Uh, especially with regard to mental health. Shay and Vicki, along with Robin Mac McGuire and others, of course, are um, part of the uh, effort to bring the CAHOOTS model to Burlington, and we felt it would be useful both for us as commissioners, but also for the public to hear about the work that they're doing. So thank you so much for being here uh, and uh, being willing to share your time and your expertise with us on, on this important issue. Thanks. Great. Well, thank, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, so we'll, go, we'll be able to just reintroduce ourselves. Yeah. So, uh, so my name is Shay Totten. I'm a resident of Ward 3, and I'm a, one of the parent volunteers with Mental Health, Mental Health First of Burlington. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into the details of what we, who we are, so you understand that, and then why we've sort of, we're 
advocating for a CAHOOTS model. It doesn't have to be CAHOOTS program itself, but a model. Hi, everybody. Thanks for this opportunity. My name is Vicki Crocker, and I'm from Vermont Family Network, and I am a family support consultant for families with mental health. Yeah, so Mental Health First Burlington um, it sort of got off the ground a couple, maybe a couple years ago. Robin and I were talking about um, our experiences as parents in Burlington, both through the school system and others elsewhere, just with the sort of gaps and sometimes in crisis services for um, for our kids. Now, our, my, my kid is, is now an adult, but um, still, you know, having experienced that and sort of understanding some of the experiences that Robin and other families we knew. So, you know, we're, we're essentially, a, we're a family-led grassroots movement calling for, you know, immediate and sort of substantial change in how we serve children and young adults uh, with mental health issues and disabilities. And often these, often the discussions that happen with system change often leave out the family and the, and the youth perspective because they sort of feel like the schools got it, right? Well, the schools don't got it. <laughs> I can tell you that for, from, from experience. Um, so we're really, really focused on more on an increased investment in sort of crisis response, prevention services to really comprehensively support uh, health, safety, and well-being of children and young adults in the community. Um, but as you'll see from our discussion with the Coots model, we, we believe it's a model that does, it serves everybody, right, and as it should. In fact, the first question we had from some folks is like, well, why isn't there, the, why isn't there an adult's version for Coots? And we're like, well, it should be, right? So we just started from what our experience was in addressing a sort of a singular gap uh, that we were seeing in the system. Um, you know, and so we're, we're a group of parent volunteers, but, you know, Vermont Family Network is one of the organizations that has been very supportive. Uh, Spectrum has also been very, very involved with this. We have private practitioners, folks who had worked at NFI um, or the Howard Center, um, as well as we've also been having some additional help, sort of some systems help, um, also from Disability Rights Vermont, um, as well as um, uh, the ACLU of Vermont. So we've been really thinking about how we sort of, as we think about these systems, how do we make sure that they're really capturing all of sort of the, the needs that are out there and addressing everything so it's not coming at it so singularly. So we really expanded our scope. And when we, just, when we expanded that scope, the, the, the model that we really sort of kept coming up with, which I think a lot of people have, and if you start Googling it, you know, you see a lot of cities around uh, the country big and small, have settled on this rather remarkable model called CAHOOTS, which for people who don't know, because acronyms are confusing, stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets. And they even admit it's kind of outdated and they should call it something else. But it operates, it's been around for 30 years. It serves Eugene, Oregon, uh, and the neighboring town of Springfield. And um, what they are is they're a non-police, trauma-informed, mobile crisis response team that operates 24-7, right? So, and they're not meant to replace the police. What they're doing is they're serving a function of the, in the community of a demonstrated need, right? And hearing the chief's report, I didn't listen to all the numbers, but it sounded like mental health was the top number, right? 92, I think it was. So, my so if we're talking about that, that is where sort of there's a gap. And I think any of us living in Burlington for any extended period of time, and I've been here for over 30 years, knows, right, that mental health response has always been a struggle, and not just in Burlington, right? So what we're looking at with CAHOOTS is that we feel as if this model, if done right in Burlington, could actually serve as a model if it's partnered right with other um, providers in the area as a model for the rest of the state because we're not unique. <clears throat> And we know that the state is actually looking at a somewhat of a juvenile model that's actually based in Rutland County because there's a need there, right? So this would be something different and unique here. But CAHOOTS, the one thing I want to mention about CAHOOTS, so the uh, CAHOOTS team, and I sent some materials around uh, to all the commissioners and for those uh, members of the public who are watching online, if you go to board docs, the document that I shared also has links to a couple of things. But one of the things we learned about CAHOOTS during a presentation that we had a uh, virtual presentation back in February where we had Tim Black from the Whitebird Clinic, which actually is the clinic that operates the CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon. We had about 100 people, and it was elected officials, it was private practitioners, it was members of the public, it was parents, um, and maybe some of you were on there, I don't know, because it was hard to sort of keep track of everybody who was on there, and it was kind of, uh, it was a little overwhelming. But one of the things we really learned out there is sort of how CAHOOTS worked, and I think if you watch that video, we feel it's pretty instructive because Tim explains it. But I'll give you a quick overview. So 
Cahoots is a team, and they have like a little mobile crisis van, and each team has a medic, so that's a nurse or an EMT, and a crisis worker, right? And they're the ones who respond. Um, and I will say that out of um, 20, and they operate independently, and they, and they also work through police dispatch, right? So they are connected, they are connected to police dispatch at all times. In fact, they work, they operate on the same frequencies, um, so they can always be in constant communication. And sometimes police serve as backup. And in fact, um, out of the 24,000 calls in 2019, uh, police backup was actually only requested 311 times, right? So they're very skilled at what they do because they do, each member of that team has 500 hours of training, largely in de-escalation, largely in trauma-informed response, and in 31 years, right, no staff member has been injured, <clears throat> no client respondent has died as a result of their interaction. And I think that's a pretty remarkable statistic one that we can't claim here in Burlington. So one of the things that I think, and I'm happy to take questions after this, I want Vicky to talk and there's, because there's lots of stuff here, so I'm gonna try to give a quick other overview because the other, the other thing is like, well, how's it funded? Well, CAHOOTS is funded through state, federal, and local funds as well as private donations. So they do pull down money from Medicaid because they are, they are a clinic. Um, there's also federal grants available. In fact, there's a federal money right now in one of the more recent um, COVID bills that actually is to, out there to help fund COVID style uh, responses. Um, and then there's usually some state funds and some local match, right? And um, overall it's about $2.1 million is the total program cost for Eugene and Springfield. And that's for 24,000 calls, right? So they estimate that they actually save uh, time from the police department to respond to these uh, in the neighborhood of about eight and a half million dollars annually on, on staffing costs for to respond to the same types of incidents um, because they probably have lower overhead. Um, and then also, but they also more, also importantly, they also save about $14 million annually in money that would have been spent on like emergency response and ambulance services because they, their mobile van is actually can transport people, right? Um, and so, um, I'm gonna turn over to Vicky, but I think one of the things is, you know, do we need cahoots in Burlington? And I think our, our perfect and simple response is yes. <laughs> um, because um, we have seen, and in in some of our families, including mine, have seen um, from both negative to traumatic experiences when police respond to youth and our children in crisis. And so we believe that um, those individuals deserve better care and we don't believe it should be on the burden and on the shoulders of police officers to respond to a mental health crisis. You know, because largely if you look at the training, I, I don't know if some of you have seen some of the training that the state police officers get or even BPD, and our estimation is completely, uh, it is not enough, right? It is not enough trauma-informed. It is not enough focus on de-escalation. Awareness isn't enough. It has to be actually modeled. And one of, the, one of the upsides of CAHOOTS is that they're trying to do is they actually do a couple of, uh, two or three times a year, they do joint trainings with the police department on de-escalation tactics that they have really perfected, obviously. Um, so we, because we really feel like this is something that um, the, a CAHOOTS model and having social workers, not really social workers, these are trained sort of clinicians that kind of come in, really help people direct services, they stick with them. Um, and they're, they're known, right? And in fact, I think in some cases, in some cities even, they have their own version of a 911 where they can call direct. But in, but in Eugene, they, they'd go direct. Um, so, because we really feel like that's, that's where we feel like, um, and with a CAHOOTS model in Burlington, making sure that there is a sort of more of a seamless sort of focus on families and children, which is something Vicki will talk to, I think is, is also something that we want to make sure that all folks who are moving in this direction keep that in mind because that too often is often left uh, off the table when we talk about these kind of services. So I'm going to leave it there for now and then answer questions after because I'd really like to hear questions from the commissioners. Well, again, I'm Vicki from Vermont Family Network, and part of my job is to help see people navigate the systems of mental health. So the families that I'm working with usually have a pretty extensive team. So they have schools involvement, they have mental health involvement, and then we're really looking at that crisis intervention because things are not working. 
And that is where we usually have the, we, we set up a, a nice plan at school, we set up a nice plan in the community, we set up a safety plan. So families are told, if something happens, what you need to do is call first call or you call 911. If it's a safety and health issue, we would call the police. So I just wanted to share like a story of a, a seven, eight-year-old child who has a mental health crisis, also may have a co-occurring um, diagnosis with maybe autism. Parents are really struggling, and then the police have the intervention that needs to come. So it's a very traumatic s situation for a child to come when there's police coming, and they're, it's not even that they're, they're doing anything wrong, it's just they're wearing a uniform, they're wearing a gun, they're, they're very intimidating for some families. And then when the child needs to be restrained, it's a really difficult situation if they're transported to um, the ED. It's this whole process that we have, the system is not family friendly and it's certainly not child friendly. So we're looking at systems of care. Is this prevention helping moving this family forward or is this an, in fact making them kind of fall behind in their prevention or adding more trauma to their already complicated um, life, right? So oftentimes, when we're looking at these interventions and trying to guide families, they don't feel like they're being heard and they also know that they're not gonna call the police the next time. Because my child spent 10 days in the, the, the ED, right? And we are really trying, every time they see a police um, officer, which really should be part of our community, then we should be fostering those relationships because they've had that experience, even though it was well-intended, for them at their mental health um, crisis at that point has been trauma for them. So when we're looking at that, I'm always looking for what the families that I work with is, where's the gaps and disconnects within this system? How can we come together as community partners and fill those gaps and disconnects? What is working and how do we move this family forward? So when Shay and um, Robin came up with the Kahoot model, it met those things. Is it helping them in the community? Absolutely, it's getting the right services to the needs of that child and that family. And then is it helping them in the home? Is it, is it the gentlest approach to meet that need for that child? Coot seems to match that, that need right now. Is it supporting the family? Is it moving that family forward, giving them the experience that is a positive experience that they feel comfortable calling for an intervention and they're gonna work with their team? Absolutely. So, and then schools. So if this becomes through like the designated agency, there is actually the social workers in the Chittenden County school systems embedded in there. So if that child has a crisis intervention, we can follow up with the school as well. So it's meeting home, it's meeting school, it's meeting community. That's a wrap service. That's a wrap service. That's what we need to do for our families to move them forward. Uh, that's pretty much all I have as far as the, you know, the, the intervention plan that I'm always looking for. I will say that families are frustrated and they're concerned and they feel helpless. And it really, we're not doing a service to our families and moving them forward if we keep them in that cycle of crisis because we can't move past it and people are feeling very stuck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, if any commissioners have any questions, now would be the time to ask um, our guests. I have a couple of questions. Um, thank you very much for coming and speaking to us tonight. I've read a lot about this model, um, especially when you look at the amount of money that's being spent. They're a fraction of the police budget, yet they're taking, um, if I remember correctly, it was like 18 to 20 percent of the, of the calls. They were able to do that. So there is, um, in addition to just social and humane value, there, there's a real cost incentive. Um, speaking to, I, I'm sorry Mr. Nick had to leave early, but speaking to some of the concerns that he had, and I recently took a stroll with him downtown, and there are, um, are, are some issues that I didn't feel were appropriate for police intervention. I mean, because we're not really like, you know, doing a minority report, right? We, we okay, we can see you're kind of hanging out, you're drinking now, but you're not really doing anything, but how do we really know what you're gonna do like four hours from now and, and do we involve a police officer to try to move you or interfere with some of your activities? Um, even though there is that open container law all around them, other people are engaging in these activities legitimately. How would that model assist with some of those types of activities? and take the burden of having to involve uh, police in those situations? Well, 
in theory, since I, haven't, uh, I, don't, I don't do it for a living. But yeah, but no, I, 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 uh, and I appreciate that because I think the CAHOOTS model is not, um, it's not a pre-crime division, it's a prevention division, right? So this is really about getting to people, um, you know, and I think it's important, but I don't think I really uh, touched upon this, you know, earlier, which I think is, and I will say, especially for, for those of us who have, had, who have family, you know, kids, right? Um, you know, who had to absorb, you know, a lot of trauma because we were terrified of the trauma that would be induced if we brought police in and lost <clears throat> control. And I will just say that's a real thing. And when Vicky said that, I mean, I will just say, like, I can still feel it, <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. and it's been years. Um, but the way that I sort of see the CAHOOTS model working is that because we are putting more resources, right, directed back to the areas that social constructs have like stripped money away and put undue burdens on systems that don't have the funding anymore really to sort of do their job, right? And support people where they're at. And CAHOOTS is a, is a step in that direction. It's not a panacea and it's not the total solution right. because we have many other things, right? But in order for it to leap from someone in mental health crisis to criminality is a massive leap, yes. right? And in terms of just as a society, I mean, that's my sort of personal opinion on that. And so I feel like, you know, the CAHOOTS model, I mean, that's a lot of what they're dealing with. They're dealing with people who often have co-occurring substance, substance misuse, um, you know, co-occurring co mental health diagnoses, um, homelessness or home insecurity. Like, they're, that, those are the folks that they're most dealing with, you know, and we've attempted to do this in, in other ways and, you know, in Burlington by sort of addressing some of like, you know, the frequent callers, right? The people who really sort of need support because other support systems have broken down. Or have, money has been funneled away from them to not apply for those 24 seven wraparound services that many people need, right? So I see the CAHOOTS model as being the one where those folks, it's not just about like, you know, like, uh, people can respond to those folks and they're more addressing what they need in the moment. So it's, it's about looking at and telling, they're meeting them where they're at rather than sort of telling them what to not to do or where to go, right? And so I think the direction is that they're treating them as a human being in need of help. And I think that's where the system kind of breaks down. And, you know, and I do feel like it's really, you know, we've pushed a lot of this stuff as a society off onto the police departments that were, have been always underfunded and undertrained to deal with this. And Vermont is, is no different. Anybody who has watched the mental health system erode for decades knows that starting in the 90s, we pushed all this stuff out, left communities to deal with it, underfunded designated agencies, underfunded community health programs. So people were left, where do they go, right? People call the cops because they think that's the only helper that's left, right? And you know, we never, you know, we never provided the training and the support to them, you know, to provide, to do that. And now this is where we're at. We're spending in, you know, too much money and not, and not giving the right supports to people in need. So for the stuff that Mr. Nick was talking about, I mean, that's largely, you know, a lot of that, um, not a lot of it, but would be cahoots, right? Because it would be people who would be called in the cahoots program would be there. It's what the street outreach program, if properly funded and staffed, could probably do. If the city of Burlington stepped up and put more money into it and not just sort of nickel and dime it, you know, we could have it funded more. And the CAHOOTS program is essentially the street outreach team model, you know, writ large, you know, with some modifications. Um, and just so folks know, too, the CAHOOTS model is actually not even unique to Chittenden County. Quite frankly, the Howard Center does something relatively similar in concert with other police departments within this county. Yes. Right, so this is not unique even to this area. You know, it would be unique to Burlington and the way the modeling that Burlington could do could actually prove a much more significant model that the rest of the state could follow. Uh, does that answer all of your questions? Yeah, no, that is great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. I fully support this model. Um, what I'm wondering is what the path forward is for you in, in bringing this to Burlington. Yeah. Um, so. The mayor's office, I mean, the mayor's, the budget did include $400,000 um, to do a pilot program. So, um, you know, the mayor's office has reached out to Robin and myself to sort of have some input on, our, on a draft RFP. And I think that's, that's sort of moving a, like through whatever the processes are right now. <laughs> I don't know which other departments are getting involved, police, um, 
uh, I think C CEDO, CJC, I think, I think the commission was going to be reached out to. I think there might be some others who were going to be instructed to kind of REIB, I think, was going to be brought in as well. Um, I'm not sure where that is right now. I know that, you know, they reached out to us early on to kind of help sort of at least sort of think through, like, what an RFP could look like. And we were actually trying to put the mayor's office in touch with Tim Black from the CAHOOTS program. But given all the national attention and the NPR and the Washington Post and everything else, like, he doesn't have a lot of time. He's really hard to get a hold of because we felt like he was really would be the best person to kind of help with that. So um, what we're hoping for is at least this to sort of start, put it out to bid, um, and see, you know, see what community agencies can kind of come up with in terms of um, what type of services that they could provide based on that model and based on some very, you know, simple directives out of, out of an RFP to serve kind of a little bit about what the CAHOOTS does and some of those basic needs that we have. You know, because I think one of the other things I didn't mention, which I think is probably evident to people in this, on this commission, of all commissions, you know, is that statistically, right, someone in mental health crisis nationally is, is uh, well, they represent like 25% of all police officer involved shootings, right, or deaths really, um, not just shootings, they, they actually die. Um, Vermont stats, I'm a little bit unclear, like, because they don't really track them that way, and I was looking at some... Uh, some are, uh, Alan Gilbert, former chair of the, former executive director of the ACLU, who tracks all this stuff. And the last decade was like the most deadly. Um, and I would say like m more than 25%. It wasn't maybe half, but it was more than that. I will say like, I, I would argue that all three of the deaths in the past, what, eight years? Um, all three, so that's 100%, were in mental health crisis. So I think when we come to when it comes to Burlington, I think we have sort of a responsibility to sort of take a look at that and where we sit nationally, and and how we're responding or and how we're falling short, because um, I think those those are important and it's not just numbers, right? Those are people. Uh, thank you. That's uh, all of that has been really helpful. So you're saying that there is a process in which they'll be issuing an RFP and local agencies will essentially respond to that RFP by developing a model um, with a budget that the city would then vote on as a model that we would adopt around mental health. Is that? Yeah, it's my basic understanding is uh -huh. how the RFP would work is, um, would be just to sort of lay out the problem, mm -hmm. right? And lay out the basic parameters, you know, and, you know, part of our, well, at least the part of, like, for Mental Health First Burlington, like, wanted to make sure that part of that is also making sure that these, whoever bids, is also demonstrating two things. One, uh, a knowledge of the service providers already existing in the area, so we're not creating new things that don't need to be created, right? So they're really responding to sort of the targeted need, but being able to understand the landscape so they can integrate with other agencies that are already doing the work and maybe already supporting these individuals in some other way. Um, the other part we really wanted to have as part of the pilot program was also something that would <coughs> allow for maybe some of those representative agencies, but also folks who have, who, um, who, have, who have lived experience to actually be part of really a review panel, not really like oversight, it's not really that sort of strict, but having them be part of an evaluative model like for this pilot year to allow them to look at data, to look at services, to look how things are being provided. Um, as a way to kind of help inform going forward. Because, you know, I, I mean, who knows? I mean, does the city need to have its own little health department that does this kind of stuff? You know, I mean, does it have its own response team? Does it, does it get merged into something else? Or is it just, you know, third party? Like a public-private partnership, which is what CAHOOTS is. Um, so, that's, so that's sort of where, I don't know how soon it's gonna go out, and I don't know how long it's gonna take for the RFP to get fully vetted and finalized. Thanks. And I just did want to mention that when we are looking at the assistance of care for the family voice, it's super important to remember that bringing more people or an, into their, their life is difficult. It's hard. They're telling their stories again and again to different people. They're having to navigate new providers, new systems of care, and they're already in crisis. So when, whatever people are doing these um, proposals, I really hope that everybody thinks about the family first. How are they going to navigate this system? Yes. What is the best way to wrap that family and our community partners that they already know? Why are we recreating new wheels all the time when we have systems that just need to be fine-tuned and we need to identify those gaps and disconnects and can we fill them so that the families can move forward? Because half the battle is navigating the systems. 
Can I just ask one follow-up question, and that is you mentioned that Howard Center is working with some other um, uh, towns in Chittenden County with a CAHOOTS-type model already. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I don't know as much about that. I mean, I know Robin had talked to them a little bit, and I don't remember which towns. I thought it was Heinsberg and maybe Shelburne, but they sort of, it's sort of, it's sort of based on their, um, oh, no, I'm totally blanking on it, <laughs> their, their normal sort of response line, but they just, but they will often respond, they will be divert, calls will be diverted to them to respond if they come through police dispatch. So I don't know much more about it than that, but I do know that they do send out Howard, it is Howard Center crisis workers who go out, sort of similar to what the, what's, it's community outreach. Community outreach, sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like totally like, oh, this is like, phew, gone. Thanks. I appreciate very much um, the, the personal stories, but also the historical presentation of the changes that have happened over time where both the schools and the police have had to absorb issues that the community is facing um, without the, the skill in some cases and also the funding that's necessary. So I really appreciate you putting that out very boldly and clearly. I'm interested to know, you talked about a model that would have a clinician and a medical person. What are the medical people in, um, in the city, how are they responding to this proposal? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, this, if they've been, I don't know if the mayor's office has reached out to, to the fire department yet in terms of EMTs and, and the, how that would work. And I mean, and I think that's some of the details that I think are still kind of fuzzy. And that's why it's a pilot project, right? Because it could be, you know, maybe it is something that gets, hot, that gets housed there. And there's extra c clinicians that are brought on staff of the city. I mean, I don't, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's sort of, so I don't know if, I don't know if we haven't talked to them okay. um, because we sort of started with like this sort of more of like an awareness campaign uh, and then really we're sort of, um, the mayor kind of heard it loud and clear and, and, and seemed to sort of be picking up on the cahoots model as well as some city councilors. I mean, I will say, you know, Karen Paul, Brian Pine uh, have been very, you know, were reached out to us and, you know, really sort of listened to some of the things that we were trying to say as well as, um, well, some of you know, some, uh, some other councils we've talked with. So every, all the councils we've talked with so far have been very supportive, at least, and have been very intrigued in trying to sort of figure out, as the council tries to figure out what it needs to wrestle with, and as it was putting together a budget, should it earmark some of this money that's coming in uh, for this kind of a program? And, you know, there is sort of some sort of savings, I guess, you know, that can be directed toward this as well, so. So thank you for your, uh, your presentation. Um, I've worked in the mental health field for, I don't know, 12 years. So I understand a lot about what you're, uh, you're talking about tonight. Um, one of the questions I have is, if we put this all together, and I think it's a great idea, what kind of, um, what kind of load is that gonna be for the hospital? I mean, because it seems like, you know, we're talking about what, 25% of the calls are mental health, is, is that? The number? Uh, the number was accurate, it was 92 over Nine. the course of that month, so 92 calls. And, and I should say this, too, is that those are the only ones that are, that are classified as mental health calls, and so there may be <coughs> mental health issues associated with other calls. Right. Those are only, that's the call okay. type that the call is classified as, so 92 out of 2,070. Yeah. I was the total number of calls, so what is that, 4% maybe? But still, Four, there may okay. be more mental health issues associated with So, that. yeah, so I'm just thinking, you know, that, you know, we're going to have to start looking at the hospital um, see, you know, what kind of, you know, care they're going to get these, our, you know, these, uh, these people. Yeah. No, thank you for mentioning that. And, and it's, it's a great point. And I wish Robin and Freedom Reguire here were here to answer that for you because Robin has been actually talking with um, and doing some work with, um, with, with UVM, um, especially, specifically around um, uh, emergency treatment and emergency care and emergency support, especially for youth and families. Um, so it, it, there is still there is still kind of a gap there as well, and so everyone has these sort of gaps. Like that's one of the reasons. This is what all the stuff we're working on. But I know that there is some. I think you might have more information. But like that's as much as I know from our end. And I'm just really curious if we had the right intervention at the start, you know, um, coming through, would we be going to the hospitals, right? So if we have that and the coup model they're embedded in the community, right? So it's not just the first time that they're gonna meet, they're gonna follow up, they're gonna build those relationships. Are we gonna, are the parents gonna reach out before this actual crisis and get those interventions? Is that team solid? Is that team working cohesively? 
That's what we're looking for. We're not looking for that crisis cycle. We're looking to move them out of it. So the right interventions with the right people that are skilled in that area is really what we're looking for. Yeah, it right. seems as if prevention is baked right in. Yeah. Yeah. RAP support is going to be very important. Um, thank you for being here um, again. Uh, just over this, after hearing your presentation, I uh, you said it was about $2.1 million was the budget for it. But what's, what's, what's the size of the people that covers of like the Eugene area? It's bigger than Burlington. <laughs> <laughs> I assumed that much, I just didn't know. I could Google that real quick. I don't remember how, I don't remember how. Eugene, Oregon has about 170,000 people. There we go. Okay. So, thank you so uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor. I mean, Less, about a quarter, three, we're one quarter of their population. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I just want to, if I can follow that thought, so I'm going to think out loud with you a moment. So 2.1 million for a town four times the size of Burlington. So half a million dollars essentially would be the equivalent for Burlington. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I mean, and that falls in line roughly with the, um, you know, the mayor has set aside for, I mean, at least according to the budget, I think it was finalized. It was like 400,000 was in the budget toward this. And I don't think that includes some of the additional money which was under 100, I think, like maybe 60,000. That was going to be additional money for street outreach, if I remember that correctly. That could be totally wrong, but I know there was some additional money going to street, street outreach as well, so that would be about right. Thank you. Are there uh, any further questions for our guest? Just a thank you for pursuing this for as long as you have and for standing up for people who need solidarity and support, our children. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much for taking the time to present to us. This is really helpful. Yeah. Thank well, you. Yeah. Thanks very much. And, and you know, feel free to reach out if you have other, okay. you know, other questions, you know, or we can follow up with anything, any information you might need. Great. Happy yeah, to provide it. Thanks. And uh, that concludes um, agenda item 5.01. Um, we will go back to agenda item 4.02, the chief's report. If uh, any commissioners have any questions with regards to the chief's report, now would be the time. So, so those new positions are the CSL positions. I believe one was actually allocated to the police department. I know there were interviews, one interview. Uh, so okay, yeah, that would be the first? The interview. And the original idea behind the CSL model was similar to the CAHOOTS program right. idea. It was what we had envisioned and modeled it after, <coughs> although it would be an officer mm -hmm. assigned with the CSL, with the CSL taking the lead in dealing with a lot of these mental health issues, um, and the officer that just there to provide support. Um, so that was originally our idea behind the CSL program. I believe we wanted six uh, initially, and were allocated one, and then two others, I believe, are supposed to reside somewhere else this city. So, okay, so one, one gets allocated to the police department. Correct. Do you know the status of the other two? If they, you might not know this, but if the other two might be hired. I know that BC went to HR to see if the other two could be Okay. And that, when is the one starting? Did you say, I'm sorry? I'm not sure that we have a start date because we just completed the interviews, I want to say, last week. Uh, so we're still in the process of, of making a decision as to the candidates. Um, I'm not involved in that directly, but, but uh, Lacey is. And how, how much of us, I know when you hire officers, there's a huge start, of, you know, the training, but what's the training time for this position, do you think? Okay, so on the job. Yes. yes. Okay. And that's one reason why she went to HR was not able to, so. Right.
Um, if I might, it, where would the other two be? So, so one position would be paid out of the police department's budget, and then do we know where the other two would be located? I do not know uh, where the other two will technically reside, under what okay. department they will reside, and perhaps CEDO maybe was, was part of the conversation, um, but I'm not sure. I don't have a definitive answer on that. Uh, they, they just allocated us the one position. Was there a reason given why all three weren't allocated to the police department? No, I'm not sure. I think there was some discussion with the city council whether or not the police department was the proper place for those individuals because their focus is mental health and, and the idea of separating these people from the police department itself. So that's my understanding of, of where the city council was. But again, that's, that's just my own perception hmm. of what the city council was thinking. Okay. discussing these positions. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, I think I'll look into that. Because I remember when um, Lacey did her presentation, um, she spoke, in my mind, it cleared up a lot of confusion, right? It, it, for lack of a better word, I know that some people in the community were worried about control, right? She made it very clear that she's very independent um, in what she does. Um, how she can go about helping people, the successes that she's had, and uh, very frank that sometimes, you know, resources were needed to be used in terms of making sure if she was heading into a situation, would it be physically safe and making those determinations as well because unfortunately some, some instances um, do require the assistance of an officer. So, okay, thank you. Uh, DC Sullivan, can you re tell us when uh, the Vermont Police Academy will be having its next session and when they would need to be alerted should the Burlington Police Department be able to hire more officers? What's the timeline? The next definitive academy is February of 2022. Okay. They have already released essentially the ability to secure spots. Uh, my understanding is that the way the process is set up, that essentially a candidate has to be pretty far through the, the multiple step process in order to secure a seat. I believe that we will be able to, assuming that we can get candidates moved through that process. We had three tests at the academy today, I want to say, or was it yesterday? Yesterday, and, and all three passed the physical test. The academy has done away with the written test. Um, so that was not part of this testing process. Can you describe the testing process, given that the written part has gone away? The, the initial test consists of a physical test, so I don't know exactly all of the criteria. I mean, when, mm -hmm. I, when I was a participant in that, it was a mile and a half run, it was a number of push-ups, it was a bench press, it was a body fat calculation, it was uh, a, a reach basically a stretch test, a sit and reach test. Um, and so that was generally what it was, sit-ups also, they, they gauge, and so it was based on Cooper standards. Um, and then the second part of that was the written test, and then the third part of that was the MMPI test. And so that information was then collected and sent out to the examiner who then makes an assessment based on the MMPI and then would forward that to a police department eventually as far as where the candidate fell in the MMPI. But the, it's that three-part process is the initial part of the process. Once they pass that, my understanding is that they would be given a personal history information packet to complete. Once they've completed that packet, they, um, they would then be given an interview. And if they pass the interview, that packet would then go for background. And then one of the final steps would be a polygraph exam. So I'm just trying to understand kind of the timeline. Should the city council make a decision to raise the cap? Um, can you help me understand what your timeline would need to be to have people attend the academy in February? And if I might just say, just for those who are not familiar, we have a functional, functional assessment of BPD being done by consulting firm CNA, who's gonna make a recommendation with regard to staffing levels in September. So with that, can you give me a sense of what you would need for timeline? 
I, I'm optimistic. I mean, one of the one of the biggest issues for us is well, one, schedule, being able to schedule a polygraph because there are so few polygraphers in the state of Vermont. Uh, occasionally, we <coughs> use polygraphers outside the state of Vermont, uh, but that's one of the sticking points. The other sticking point is the background itself, because it it relies on other people to respond to the, the inquiries from a detective so that we can complete the background investigation and compile all that information. So that usually takes maybe three weeks as far as a background uh, investigation would go. Um, and, then it, and then it comes down to our capacity as well because it is usually assigned to a detective. Occasionally we will assign them to other officers in the police department, again, depending on capacity. Um, but it does take a couple months in, in general to move somebody through that background process um, I feel like we have enough time at this point, certainly, to be able to put a few candidates in the 20, 2022, February of 2022 Academy. I would just keep in mind that those officers, assuming we've only had a, around a 50% success rate, because once they go through that initial hiring step, those initial hiring steps, they go through the police academy and then they're in a field training process, which is extensive and we about 50% tend to succeed in actual completion. We would not have those officers out on the street as what we call a solo officer, being able to respond to calls themselves until the fall of 2022. Mm -hmm. So it is a process. Normally there are two police academies per year. Um, this year, because of COVID, it, it, they only had one police academy, so I, I believe they were only able to put 22 officers through the Vermont Police Academy this past year. Uh -huh. for 2020 for the whole state right and, and usually we're only allocated six seats is the maximum historically we've only ever put four or five into an academy class and at a 50 percent success rate you know best case scenario we're we're gaining six solo officers per year mm -hmm. thank you thanks uh, i just want to say moving forward uh if you're gonna, please talk uh, close into the mic just so time meeting tv can pick it up thank you And are there any further questions for the chief with, with regards to his report? Um, not seeing any, um, so we'll close that agenda item and move to agenda item 5.02, which is uh, the annual report of the Board of the Police Commission. And uh, for those that are at home, um, if you go to our board docs, you can see the report um, listed there. And basically what the report um, <clears throat> covers is a summary. Sorry, let me get to the beginning here. Uh, basically, a summary of our police commission activities for FY21, um, a summary of complaints that were uh, logged in to the online portal, um, in addition to um, policies that we worked on, accommodations of the word to uh, the BPD, and um, uh, if I'll let um, no, just a few other things. We, we reported on the trainings that we underwent, the work that we did with the joint committee, and two reports that we issued this year. Uh, so that is what is in the annual report. And, sorry. Um, and with that, I would I'd like to make a motion that we accept this um, report and for submission to, to the mayor and uh, to the city. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, uh, raise your hand or say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. I just want to thank uh, Stephanie for all the work that went into that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, that moves us on to agenda item 5.03, which is um, a city clerk, clerk treasury update uh, with regards to uh, the commission.
launched. So. Awesome. I've got it on the uh, board docs. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, just so they can pick it up on town meeting TV. Thank you. Um, so I had the pleasure of speaking with you all five years ago, and I don't see many familiar faces from that <laughs> time. Um, and at that point, the um, capital plan was adopted in September of 2016. And in that fall, we went to the voters for a bond for $27.5 million, which we were successful at. And five years has gone by. We have spent all of that money. Um, but the city's capital plan continues on, and our infrastructure needs continue on as well. And um, so this is just a little, hopefully I can move through it quickly. It does have some pertinence to the police commission in that one of the things that we added as we evolved in the capital plan is public safety infrastructure. And so when we first came up with our capital plan, um, we spent 18 months developing it, but we didn't get everything. Um, and so it's an evolving process. And one area that we were short in was our public safety infrastructure. And so we have been working with both the police and fire over this time and have expanded it and in this next request that we hope to go to the voters for there is 5.7 million dollars for public safety infrastructure which covers replacing the overall radio infrastructure for the city for all of public safety and it is at end of life and we would very much like to replace that it also includes um, items such as the axon body cameras and the annual radios that need to be replaced. Um, it's about $100,000 a year of radios that we replace. It also includes on the fire side um, some defibrillators and things <coughs> of that sort as well. Uh, so I'll just run through this, but that's my key critical takeout for you all is that we have now involved both the police and fire capital into the capital plan. And I think it's really important that the public and you understand that um, we feel it's important to take care of this item and the police and fire departments as we move forward. So, um, so over this five years, what have, what have we accomplished? We've improved 14 miles of sidewalks. On average, prior to this, we covered one mile of sidewalk a year. We're now covering three miles of sidewalks a year. We've doubled our street maintenance. So we were spending $1 million a year. We're spending $2 million a year. And with climate change and the use of our streets, we're still having trouble keeping up with taking care of our streets. Um, I sort of always use the joke that um, our capital needs will go away when our potholes go away, and they don't seem to ever go away. There's always one that somebody can find. We rehabilitated seven miles of the bike path. We created a new parks facility maintenance building at Letty. At that time, we also in, um, implemented a fueling station there where I believe the majority <coughs> of the police vehicles are refueled. 
It saved them having to drive to 645 Pine to refuel at the end of each of their shifts. So it allows them to have less time on the road fueling and more time doing their job. We've improved a number of um, city buildings with their envelopes, their insulation, new roofs, new HVAC. We put in, um, two new HVAC units into the police department. Um, this improves the efficiency, the comfort of the employees, and reduces costs, operating costs. It works us towards our net zero energy goal. We improved our IT infrastructure. We implemented a number of security items. Um, DC Sullivan has very, been very helpful as we have looked at security in our various buildings and we improved both 645 Pine and this building with security improvements that make both the public safer and the employee safer. Um, and at the same time, we put in some electronic door systems, so most of the buildings now have an electronic door system and if there is an emergency in a building, it can be locked down. It can also unlock it for every, every policeman can get into any building via this way. Uh, we um, consolidated all of our video security systems and it used to be each building had their own security system and somebody in that building could look at it, but nobody else could. We put them all together into one large system. That system resides in dispatch. So if there is a call and someone is, we'll use City Hall Park as an example since it's outside here. If there's an event there and someone calls 911, the dispatch can pull up those cameras and they can speak with the responding officer and they can say, hey, there's a gentleman in a blue hoodie on, as you go around the corner to your left, and he can be aware of where the danger points are and can respond better. We created an asset management uh, committee, which um, right now we're implementing a software system that holds all of our inventory of our assets, and this helps us make our capital plan down the road better by giving us good data on what is at risk of failing and what we need to replace first and what's doing well. And maybe it should be at end of life, but it's doing well so we don't have to replace it. So we spend our money better. Um, and again, we improve this plan to put in public safety. Um, and we have also two other committees, a capital committee. So for the general fund, there is a capital committee that meets and it's made up of Public Works, Parks, and CEDO, but we bring in other entities as we have needs and they look at the overall requests for projects and then help prioritize and approve those rather than when I first started, it was just me. And so it's really hard to be the only person that says yay or nay to something. So a committee is very helpful, creates a nice um, group of people that are making good decisions for the city. And we set up a fleet committee and pulled again, all of our vehicles were being bought by department. We pulled them all together. We have a fleet manager who manages it and makes those decisions and works with each department and helps us get the vehicles that we need. So we have um, financing both through a master lease and part of it is in this, in this bonding. So there's fire trucks in the bond, uh, snow plows and sidewalk tractors. So all of those have a life of more than 10 years and it is more efficient and more cost effective for us to bond for those rather than to go for a lease. Just some pictures of some uh, line striping for crosswalks and the bike path. What did we learn? Um, it's evolving. So the capital plan is a picture and it's uh, uh, in time but it's really evolving and you have different events that make it change day to day. We had last week a huge rainstorm that creates a washout, that creates a capital project. And so those things change every single day. You have a, an HVAC unit that fails or a vehicle that fails, it has to be replaced and it isn't necessarily one that you knew about. And as I said, we didn't know that all, what all of our assets are. 
We're still learning that. I expect that we will continue to learn that over time. We have decades of deferred maintenance, and it's going to take decades for us to take care of it. Um, our capital needs are never going to go away, and they're probably not going to get a lot smaller, especially as the city continues to evolve and grow. We really want to uh, pull it together. The purpose has been to pull everything together and have a good understanding and be able to have an overall strategy for the whole city and prioritize and make good decisions across the board. And so there aren't silos that one person is doing one thing and another person doing another. When I first started, uh, they had a road that they paved and the next year the water department dug it up because they had to put a new pipe in it. That really, it double cost to the city. That's what we're trying to avoid. Our fiscal year 22 budget survey that went out that the administration put out showed that there was good support for this infrastructure. I always say capital planning is like a car. You have an investment when you buy your car and then you gotta change the oil every year then sometimes you're gonna to have to replace the brakes and that's a little bit more of an expense. Capital and operations go hand in hand. So there's repairs that come through the operational budget that DC Sullivan manages and then there is the capital project that comes when you have to replace that vehicle at the end of the time. And so it really takes all of us collaborating together to make it work to the best, to save the most money and be the most efficient for the city. I'm here to give you this next three-year capital plan. I'm meeting with all of the commissions, all of the NPAs. I'm working on meeting with any group that I can meet with, that we can educate about what the needs are, why it's important, what it will do for the public, for the commissions, for each group of people. Because we truly want to meet everybody's, we can't meet all the needs, but we can hear all of them and accommodate as much as we possibly can. We are going to the Board of Finance and City Council on August 9th for the first informational conversation. They will get this same presentation probably tweaked a little bit between now and then um, from input from folks such as yourselves. Um, and then we are hoping that between that and the meetings with all the commissions and um, NPAs that we will have support at the council on, in September to be able to go for a bond in November for a special election on November 9th. That's our goal. And during that time frame, we will refine and uh, educate more on our needs and what those priorities are. We're lucky this year, I guess if you want to say that COVID is a lucky thing, but through the pandemic, there's federal funding that has come available and more opportunities. The state in also has some new dollars that have never been available before th for climate change, for infrastructure. There's the new federal bill that is coming out um, for infrastructure. We want to use our money as smart as we possibly can. And so we are looking at all of these opportunities and how we can use these different funding opportunities to fulfill all of the need. Um, and we need much more than we're asking for at this point. It is a continuing need. So having these other areas is going to help us hopefully prioritize that and make some good decisions. So on an annual basis, we want to continue the investment that we've been doing over the last five years. So on the left is what we have been investing every year on these different parts. And on the right-hand side is what we have for a three-year need. Now, for the public safety, you'll go down and there's no number over on the right-hand side. We're still learning what that annual need is. But we do know that we need to replace your radio infrastructure and that it, it is sorely in need of replacement. We know that we need to get the radios. We know that we need to get the body cameras. Those are there. And so um, it's hard to break that into an annual number. Um, for facilities and parks projects, uh, it fluctuates somewhat depending on which plan they're doing. So 
uh, <coughs> facilities. We spent $2.6 million on this building, if, and we just scratched the surface of it. There's probably another five million that could be put into this building if to bring it up to where it should be. And every single one of our buildings has a need. And so to four and a half million will get us somewhere, but it's not going to get us to the end. Our parks um, has a wonderful master plan that they have done. And they are trying to prioritize on those projects which will help bring revenues to the city. So they are one of our largest revenue earners for the city. And so as a look at their master plan and their strategy, we're trying to prioritize those programs which will help bring tourists and money to the city. So we are looking to ask for $30 million in November. There are a number of other, those are talking about our annual needs. There are a number of other grant projects and other areas that it's, uh, we are leveraging our dollars on. So uh, there's the rail yard enterprise that the council approved this past spring. There's Champlain Parkway, Shelburne Street Roundabout, rail re realignment. Those projects are about $64 million worth of projects. The city's match on that is around five to $6 million. So we're leveraging our dollars to be able to do larger projects. Uh, we have our master plans that we're implementing and then there are a number of other uh, large projects that we're considering, but we don't have funding for at this point. The library has revisioned what should the, uh, a library of the 21st century look like? What should it do? How does it help our community? They had a consultant come in, do designs, look at that, and it's about $22 million. Uh, the fire stations, had, they had them come and do an assessment of them and it was found that they could consolidate one station and still have the same response times that they have currently. That's about $16 million. Um, Memorial Auditorium is always discussed. The last time it was close to having something happen, it was about $34 million. Um, the Public Works Group have been talking about a consolidated collection to be more efficient on our trash and recycling. That's about $6.7 million. Um, so there are a lot of other big projects out there. Our needs are not going to be met solely by this $30 million. Our goal is to come up with a sustainable level over time so that we don't continually come back for large groupings and say that it's $7 million a, a year that right now we get $2 million for capital. And that was approved in 2012. So we've gotten no increase in since 2012. We believe seven million is a reasonably sustainable number if the voters were to approve that on an annual basis. Then the only time we would have to come back to the voters is when we wanted to do a large project such as the library or the fire stations. And that would, um, I think, be an easier method in which to manage a capital plan. It always ties into our operational side. So there's pavement markings, there's landscaping, there's facilities management. We have to work hand in hand on all of this. What's holding us back from asking for more than $30 million? We have a debt cap policy that was set three years ago. It's around $209 million. And right now, uh, 110 million of that have been utilized and, the, and 70 more has been obligated to the schools. So this is split between the schools and the general fund. So really there's only $30 million left on this cap in order to ask for anything. Um, and it will be a discussion as we go forward is, you know, what do the schools need to do? Is it a compromise between one or the other? And that's a conversation that will continue to happen. We're looking at all the other funding opportunities. We would like to ask the voters to approve a new bond in November. And at the same time, I'm working to come up with what is the strategy and how do we create this sustainable level of investment on an annual basis in our capital plan. 
And the longer we defer it, the more it's going to cost us. So this is my schedule of meetings, and I, I added two more tonight. So I found um, there were particularly, or another area that we're trying to reach is the BIPOC communities, and so trusting communities is one area, and there's a group out of UVM that also uh, works with those communities, and so I'm trying to make presentations and have it translated <coughs> for them as well. But um, those are our goals. Questions? I have a question out of curiosity. Do you know how many cameras there are in the city? Uh, there is uh, around 300 cameras around the city. 300? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, what consolidation of the fire departments are you, are they considering, the city considering? So they did an analysis of the location and whether they could consolidate. And the uh, assessment came back with that they could consolidate uh, Fire Station 1 on North Winooski and Fire Station 5, which is on... Uh, it's in the south end, um, and it's going to be affected by the Champlain Parkway should it go in. So those two could be consolidated um, in a location in between the two, and it would maintain those response times. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, any further questions? I don't have a question as much as a statement. Um, I have a kind of love for what Memorial Auditorium used to be, and, and right now, for all intents and purposes, it's an abandoned building. And I think that, um, you know, I'd ask the mayor if the, any of the opera funds could be used toward that building. You know, as you just said, the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost, and that's where we are with this particular building that I think could return as a community center and um, you know I remember the rock camp being there and just other activities for young people because we've we've lost a lot of that especially during COVID um, and that has led to some of the um, for lack of a better word mischief that is going on in the community so um, I just want to give a shout out to Memorial Auditorium if you can get some of that ARPA money I think that would be uh, a great thing for our downtown to have that building back in the public interest. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further questions, so I just, I'm going to say thank you very much for this. Um, I very much appreciate it, and um, good luck moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate it. A absolutely. Closes that agenda item 5.03. Moving on to 5.04, which is um, uh, NACL training for uh, BPD. And uh, with that, I'll give uh, the floor to Stephanie. Uh, so, one of the things that we learned in the NACL training is that NACL actually recommends training of the police department about civilian <coughs> oversight. Um, I think there's a sense that it that civilian oversight can really benefit the police department and community trust. And so this would be, um, this is, you know, would be perhaps useful for BPD to engage in with Nicole. And uh, we thought it would be useful just to present this idea uh, at a commission meeting, uh, perhaps to ask DC Sullivan if he wants to comment on that. I realize it's sort of on short notice, but just to put it out there to think about whether um, it, you might consider a training from NACOL for the BPD on the role of civilian oversight. Yes, I think I think we would be open to that. Uh, certainly, we I I did audit uh, some of the NACOL training that was provided to the police commission, and I thought there was a lot of valuable information in that training. I, I think it would be a valuable collaboration to to learn more about civilian oversight. Certainly. So if it would be helpful, I can certainly connect you with um, Cameron 
McElhenney from NACOL that did our trainings and leave it to the two of you, um, to you and the, the leadership of the department to work with NACOL. Sounds great. Good. All right. Um, not any further comment on that. Uh, I'll close agenda item 5.04 and move on to agenda item 5.05, .05, which is a presentation from the BPOA. So with that, I invite you to uh, the podium. Sorry, table. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Joseph Coro. I'm with the Burlington Police Officers Association. I'm the Vice President. This is Megan O'Leary. She's our Secretary. Um, we work in the Executive Board pretty much day and night. So uh, what we have for you today, I sent you, I put in board docs actually, is the data that I was able to obtain or we were able to obtain. Over the course of three or four weeks, I left the survey open for the union as well as for the supervisors. So this is everybody that works the department right now, that's a sworn officer except for the chiefs. That's responded to this. Obviously not everyone responded, but the majority did. Um, I did not give you the 50 responses for the, some of the open-ended questions. I did give you the graphs. Um, I do wanna read you some of the open-ended question responses, um, just kind of the themes that I'm seeing and that we're seeing as a union. Um, so the first question, which you do not have in front of you, is why are you still working at BPD? Because that's a legitimate question that most of us are curious, at, curious for right now, because um, we have had a lot of people leave. So I'm just gonna read through about 10 of them for you. Uh, the first one is, I personally had the opportunities to fill different positions within the department and have had more senior officers guide me into other positions to take over. The schedule, well, what was our schedule before we got screwed due to staffing was another perk. Ironically, the good amount of overtime available was also a perk, but it's starting to lose its appeal as is because more of, it's more of a forced option than voluntary. Uh, I'm just reading these per verbatim. I'm keeping out any swears that were put in there. Obviously, these were people that were venting um, and they're giving their opinions anonymously. Uh, the next thing is, why are you still working at BPD? Uh, number one, the coworkers. Number two, the schedule. Number three, a source of income. Um, the next one is multiple years on, but they are currently looking for another position somewhere else outside of Burlington. Um, the next one is, at this point, I am essentially a hostage. Policing skills while highly sought after and somewhat rare do not translate well to occupations outside of law enforcement, <clears throat> especially in a state as occupationally des destitute as Vermont. The union previously did a good job in negotiating a well-paying contract. Unfortunately, that pay is the only thing keeping me in the building, in parentheses, which goes against everything I was taught about not getting a job just for the money. I did not start this job for pay. It was garbage at the time when I started, but now it is my only reason for staying. The job used to be fun and occasionally satisfying and rewarding, but now it's constantly miserable. Most of that misery is being generated by the city, the city administration slash council. The council in the city is the most dishonest, hate-filled group of people I have ever encountered in my entire profession. I have given the best years of my life to this job, getting kicked, punched, and spit on, only to be rewarded with a group of people intentionally spreading lies and hatred about me and my coworkers to further their misguided ideologies. I do have a lot of close, close friends here, but we will still be friends after I move on to better things. Um, why are you still working at BPD? I do not know. Last summer, my daughter was terrorized at Burlington Parks and Rec summer camp by other children when she men mentioned I'm a police officer. They threatened to light our car on fire and kill me and my wife. My daughter has had difficulties processing this and still will not talk to me about it. Uh, the next one, I am held hostage by the pension plan. If I leave now, I receive a fraction of what I will receive if I stay the full 20 years. This is the one and only reason I am still working for the city of Burlington. Uh, the next one, currently looking to leave. I cannot work for a city that does not support its officers. Burlington was the place all Vermont officers wanted to work. Now, unfortunately, the city council has ruined our reputation and we'll be lucky to have good qualified candidates apply here. And next, uh, coworkers, schedule, and to some extent, the pay keeps me here, but that is quickly becoming insufficient in the face of the mounting hurdles. The only reason I am still at BPD is to provide for my family. While I love the work I do, I could do it for another city that respects its employees, prioritizes officer safety and support, and doesn't play games with people's lives, but I won't relocate my family. I have never worked for a city that feels more openly hostile to those who would risk their lives for them. Uh, so question two, I think you can pull it up on board docs, or you should be able to, is are you actively seeking new employment? Uh, this was unfortunately not shocking to the union. I think it's gonna be shocking to some people. Um, but 56% of the union is currently looking for 
employment somewhere else. Um, so that's 28 of the 50 that responded to my survey for the union specifically, not for the supervisors. The next one is rank the below reasons from most to least importance why you're still considered staying at BPD. Um, the top currently, from what I can see, if I'm reading the survey right, because I actually struggled with the graph itself, but is the schedule. The next is the salary wages. Um, and then the next one after that is friends. And then the current, their current position that they are in right now, whatever that assignment might be. And then the last is the policing profession. Question four is what are the three things you would want to see changed in the city and the department currently? This one's a little bit long. Um, but the city council and the police commission have shown a lack of understanding of the police profession. Their decisions and rhetoric against the Burlington Police Department have harmed this agency and made not only the officers, but the community as a whole left safe. This has also emboldened anti-police activists, academics, and local media to carry out consistent anti-police activities that make our profession substantially more difficult with the consistent misinformation campaign. I would like to see our elected, elected officials showcase the phenomenal police department we are and help shift the negative image that has been portrayed. We are a small community and need to pull through this situation in a unified manner. I firmly believe that with the professionals, professionalism of our agency and little help from the community, a little help from the community, we can show the rest of our great union that a city police department can work in harmony with its people. Keep Vermont weird, in quotes, for the police department. We need more staffing so we can lessen the burden on our officers. The work-life balance is not present right now and it is not safe or healthy, especially long term. Officers need to be cultivated and supported in seeking career growth. Currently, this agency is not able to provide the dynamic career paths it once did. Being able to mix it up with varying assignments and schools helps make more capable officers while making for a more sustainable long-term career. Last, the internal pressure needs to stop. Next is uh, number one, increase staffing within the department. Number two, increase opportunities within the department. Number three, have city leaders be educated on the details of police work in Burlington and understand what we do and why we do it. Have leaders that do not focus on flashy headlines and progressive trends without proper analysis of practical application. Have leaders that have integrity and the courage to support good police work even when it is unpopular. We, number one, we desperately need to retain officers and hire new officers. We are losing the most marketable people. That means smartest, most talented, and experienced are leaving due to bad conditions. BPD has experienced a talent and experience drain that needs to be remedied immediately. It will take decades to make up for this loss. Number two, support from the city. There are good people working here and they are being attacked from the inside. With the ultimate cost being the most vulnerable people in the city, we have been made villains for political gain. Number three, pay and benefits, primarily guaranteed time off, better pay, improved pension and benefits. Um, just going back to where this person points out, you're losing the most marketable people. Recently, we lost somebody who had 10 plus years of experience and had a master's uh, in a couple things. So we are losing, we aren't just losing like newer people and we aren't just losing people that can retire. We're losing people right in the middle who would have served the city for 10 to 15 more years. Um, and they're, you know, that's a ton of experience you're losing right there. Uh, so the next one is, I'm leaving, but I can say the following. Lacking or weak vocal, written, and consistent support in public and in the press from city police administration for police officers. Any public official, including members of the police commission and city council who've stated factually incorrect and slander statements about the departments, members should have at worst been publicly censored, but realistically suspended or removed from their positions. Last I checked, due process and thorough real investigations were still a thing. Two, loss of officers and positions and easily forecastable ongoing losses has eliminated BPD's ability to provide incentives and ongoing professional development for those who remain. We are no longer a professional, well-run, or premier law enforcement agency in New England. Call volume and officer responsibility volume has not changed. Staff calls and shifting the contractual schedule is a smoke and mirrors approach that is clearly designed to make the public happy and only adds to the stress of the employees, including dispatch. This approach pushes the subtle and not so subtle underlying message that the city only grudgingly knows its police officers acknowledges its police officers, but certainly does not care about their personal well-being beyond the level that they have to as an official employer. To answer this, eliminate a menu of calls that police currently go to. Uh, the next one, no idea, maybe a good start would be for city councilors and police commissioners to actually have a knowledge base on how to police before tearing the department apart. Number, the next one is number one, if the city wants a better police department, they should invest in that department, not defund it. I would like to see police officers not vilified for the purpose of achieving racial equity. It's just driving away our better and more motivated cops. Also, you're not going to change officers' hearts and minds that way. Our police commission is out of touch with the needs and realities of being a police officer. For an example, when a black man punched a female officer in the face and strangled another officer, 
and police officers tased him, and the, pol the police were then criticized. The same black man also tried to break into a family's home with terrified children and damaged their car. That same man later carjacked a, carjacked a woman. Uh, it is appalling that the police commission is identifying this person as a victim when he was assaulted, he has assaulted and terrified so many people in our community. Next is one, more money for prof profession that nobody wants. Number two, support from city council and police commission. And then number three says, let's just start with these two. Uh, number one, actual dialogue amongst all people instead of one-sided discussions under the guise of supposed listening, referring to the city. Increased pay to compensate for the increased workload demanded by the reduction in the police force. Higher wages, less police involvement in non-police issues, plus adequate substitutes to take the place of a police response, and less of a hostile environment towards police fostered by those in charge of the city. Uh, the next question is, if you are seeking new employment, what could the city do to keep you here? Uh, as said in number four, this agency's use used to be able to provide more career options for a long-term career. Right now, we reasonably cannot. A properly staffed agency is able to have a dynamic set of opportunities for officers. If you're working for the Queen City of a state, it's reasonable to assume you have access to such a career. The anti-police rhetoric from the city needs to stop and should showcase how great an agency we actually are. With appropriate numbers and funding, coupled with a change in this information campaign, I would consider staying. Seeking life elsewhere is not a decision I take lightly, and I had planned on a long career of service to this great city. Right now, that plan does not seem feasible with the current direction the city is taking with this agency. Number two response was maintain a decent schedule, increase pay, create a healthier, more positive working environment. Next is refund police and numbers of officers to increase. City, the city is creating an officer safety issue and is causing a lack of appropriate resources to adequately police this city. This person said, if I were seeking new employment, which is a real option depending on the city council and mayor's actions after, after the consulting firm concludes its recommendations for the police department, the schedule would have to remain as close to possible as what we currently have, considerably more pay to be able to live in a more comfortable life in this disproportionately expensive area, and the administrative staff would have to stand up to the city council and the mayor when it's clear their actions and words are inappropriate and affecting the well-being and all employees. Next is, while I am not actively seeking employment, I am keeping my options open and I would not hesitate to leave if a better opportunity presented itself. The job is getting worse. This all being said, the truth is that the pay, pension, and benefits are the only thing that really keeps me here at BPD currently. I am more open to a career change. UVM Medical Center is offering 100% differential for nurses to work overtime this summer. In parentheses, yes, that's double pay. With two years of school, I can make better base pay, work fewer hours, make good overtime pay at my own choosing and stay in the area. Next, I would will be willing to take a pay cut to be offered a different position somewhere else due to the work environment in this city. If I was offered another job, I would believe that I would need a substantial monetary incentive to stay, most likely more than 20,000 or 30,000 per year. Secondly, I believe the city should be releasing positive messages to the community about the police department and all the good work that is accomplished and the professional and caring officers that are employed at BPD. This person said, at this point, nothing. It will take 10 years at best to reverse the damage done in the last year. The numbers will continue to dwindle and the city will continue to become more and more unsafe. Why would anyone want to be a police officer in the city? If they do, they are not a reasonable person. In the not so distant past, BPD was the pinnacle of law enforcement in this state. Officers and detectives from agencies all over the state would come to us for help, advice, and gui guidance. Now we are a laughing, stops, laughing stock and the other cops just feel sorry for us. The city, namely city officials, must be willing to openly accept the responsibility for the current state of BPD and spiraling negative morale. These issues are a direct result of the actions and decisions of a handful of people who have no real knowledge, real world knowledge of how BPD or police as a social construct operates and interacts with actual Burlington residents and visitors. Nor have they been willing to educate themselves about policing by participating in ride-alongs or even coming to speak with any actual BPD officers in a setting which would allow them to get to know the officers and understand who we are and how we are trained. Increase the number of police officers. Also, if Tier 3 retirement was changed to Tier 1, I would heavily consider staying. We should also be paid at least 50 to 20K more in our base salary. Pay me more or less in the workload, hire more officers, keep the schedule, bring back specialty units, provide and support your police officers that support your community. All right, and the last question, which you should have as well, says, would you encourage your friends or family to apply to BPD currently? That is 96% said no. Uh, this sticks out to me because when I started at this department, the ma a majority of people referred their friends and family to work at our department. I referred one of my family members that actually works here currently, um, and I wouldn't anymore either. I'm one of those no's. Um, so 
I'll go over the supervisors, it's a lot shorter. There's not, you know, I'm not gonna read off 10 because there was only a few nine or 10 supervisors that responded anyway, which is the majority of them anyway. Uh, but going back to why are you still working at BPD? BPD used to be an agency with career potential through various different assignments. Those assignments have dwindled to, to nothing due to staffing levels. I'm still here because of the excellent officers I work with, the pension and the reliable paycheck. If I were to some, find something with decent compensation, I would likely leave. I also have active applications out to other agencies to explore other options. Uh, for the supervisors, you have 33% of, the, of them are currently actively seeking new employment. And they, their reasons for staying are a little bit different. Uh, their top was salary and wages, then it's schedule, then it's friends, then it's current position. Actually, I think it's almost exactly the same. And then the policing profession. And then the reasons that would keep people here go back to a little bit more pay, some type of retention bonus, retirement or health care after retiring, um, retention bonus again, as well as possibly a health care option similar to what the state police does. And then would you encourage your friends or family to apply to BPD currently? All, off, all supervisors that responded to this said no, it was 100% no. Uh, I, I'm not here to, I read those verbatim, I'm not here to say that you are doing a terrible job, I'm not here to blame you, I'm not here to do any of that. I'm just here to make you aware of what the officers that currently work at the department are thinking, as well as how many of them are actually looking to work somewhere else. It's almost every day that I hear that somebody, somebody I didn't know was looking is looking for employment somewhere else. And I'm not talking about just looking for employment in a different field, I'm talking about like going to South Burlington Police Department, or Polchester Police Department, or Vermont State Police. This, just from, I've worked here seven years now, I've been, well, I've worked here seven years as a police officer. I've been, I've been here for nine. Um, it's crazy to me that there was a time when the people that are saying this are absolutely right. We were the pinnacle of law enforcement in the state. We were, like, people wanted to come here. It did not matter where you worked in this, in this state. Unless you didn't want to work in a busy department, you wanted to come here for the opportunities, and you wanted to come here because you were busy and there was actually things to do and you could make change and actually affect change. People do not feel that way anymore. They're holding on to friends, pension, and salary. That's, that's scary because every day their friends are leaving, so that's one thing that's gone. Salary only lasts so long. Money's not gonna keep you anywhere. Money does not keep you happy forever. Um, so once that's gone, that's all there is. And pension, all they have to do is do some digging and actually, if they're under 15 years, they can make this work. They can take their pension or leave it and let it grow, and they'll be fine, they can go somewhere else. If those are the only three things that are keeping you, that, that scares me. Um, because that's, that's not a lot that's holding people here. And I just hope that, I know, you, I know September is when CNA is finishing its assessment. I can tell you right now that is, if that's, what, if that's what the city council and everybody's waiting on to make their decision if we need to increase the cap or not, you're too late. You will be too late by that time. And as you know, if that number is not what people expect at the department, you probably lose more people. Because right now there's very few opportunities. That's not, that's not hidden either, that's, that's very clear. So, you know, I just wanted to pass this along. I don't mean to be all doom and gloom, but I also need to give you the reality of the situation. Um, I know very few people at the department that currently aren't looking for jobs elsewhere. Uh, and I hate that, because I, I planned on spending my entire career here. Um, even I'm, I've looked, and I have my feelers out in different places, and I'm not afraid to admit that, because I've been through enough at this place. Um, but, the biggest thing is, is I was planning on serving this, this city for 28 years of my life, 28 years of my life. It's a 25 year career here, but I started when I was 21, so for me to collect I would have been 50, which would be 28 years-ish. Um, and now I don't know if that's feasible and a lot of officers feel that way. And I just hope that we can do something to show the officers in the union and the supervisors that we want them to stay here. You all, we also have to make it so that we, people want to come here. Um, I'm not trying to give too many solutions because obviously it's not really my job, but I am going to point out what's the fastest thing you can get in here for police officers to fill empty spots? It's waivers from this own state. If you can convince people from this state that work at other departments to come here, that is the fastest you can get somebody on patrol helping us out. But that means that you have to convince somebody who works at Colchester, South Burlington, VSP, anywhere else in the state that they should come here because it's worth it. Whether that's incentives or whatever, whatever that may be, you have to be able to convince them of that. And I can tell you right now that as somebody I teach at the police academy, I don't know of anybody 
I've, heard, I've gotten a lot of, I'm sorry you work there and I'm sorry you're going through this, but I have not got, hey, can I apply there? And we used to get that when we would go down. We would, you know, how, how long's your process? You know, what do I have to go through? What's the expectation? That's what we used to get, and now we get, I'm sorry, I would never want to work there. I would love to see that change, and I know right now we're speaking like this, but as I said before, I would love to meet with you. We would love to meet with you to talk about that some more, um, and we hope to keep this communication open as an open line of communication so we can actually work through some of this stuff. I also think it's very important that you all do ride-alongs to get an actual first-hand view of what we do, because it's easy to, you know, sit there and say, well, you could have done this, but you you weren't there, nor do you have our training, nor do you have the full details. As much as we think this has everything, it does not. So ride-alongs are crucial, whether you believe that or not. So I'd be um, more than happy to take anybody. I'm currently the recruiter, but pick a time and I'll be there. Signing up. Yeah, See too. you there. Perfect. Um, so also one thing I want to point out, and I, I brought it to Chair Gamash, we talked about it a little bit. If you are interested as a patrol procedures instructor myself, um, you know, there's a community academy we've done in the past. We would be more interested in doing a more detailed, thorough academy with you, where we could go into more detail and more depth into a lot of the topics that are covered in the community academy, um, but more geared to what you're dealing with. So it's not just like an overview, you actually get a little more um, experience out of it. Can you repeat that? I didn't quite hear what you just said. The community academy is what we normally oh, do, but uh -huh. we did not do it last year due to COVID. Um, I'm talking about setting up a program that you can all attend that's even more in depth than the community academy, just to get you more experience, more exposure and understanding of things that you may not have had a chance to sit through yet. Um, but also, I'll, I'll go off of what uh, Meg just said, I also will take you on a ride along anytime you wanna go, so once your stuff's in, I already told them that the e-board, executive board would be willing to take you on a ride along. So whenever you wanna come in, we can have this, this conversation in the car and we can ride all around and you can see some of the calls that we're going to. Um, and also be aware that the last thing I'm gonna add, and then I'll stop, the last thing I'm gonna add is be aware that because we have so fewer officers, you now have an officer that was taking 100 calls is now taking you know, 200, 250 calls for service. So now you're, that officer's burning out faster and they're working 60 hours a week because they're trying to cover other holes. So that's a lot of burnout on one person. Um, and we can only do that for so long. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them too. I just want to acknowledge that how hard a time this is for um, the BPOA and the officers, and I really appreciate you sharing that information with us. It's very sobering. Um, we have, in, in several meetings that you've mentioned, the idea of meeting with the police commission. I think that would be important to do, and Chair Gamash, I hope that we can arrange that. As you know, issues around public meetings and so forth constrain how we do that, but I think that would be um, really important to do. I've done several ride-alongs with BPD, but I'm really interested in doing and tonight. In fact, I'm gonna to try to sign up for one with all of you. So um, thank you for that. I really appreciate the information. Of course, and if you've done them before, realize that we're in a much different time now, so you may see some things you didn't see last time. Um, and depending on what you've done, as I said in the last, the last meeting I spoke at, you know, five or 10 ride-alongs is gonna give you a good view of what we do compared to one or two, because if you come on a night that you know, we have nights where we're slow that we didn't expect it, and then we have nights that are crazy busy. So it just depends on the night you come. You may see something one night that you wouldn't have seen the other night. Hi, I had a couple of questions. Um, we had a discussion before, and I think it was frank, open, honest, a little difficult, but those are quite frankly during these times the best kind of conversations to have. So I definitely um, would like to have more of those. Um, one question I had, I was curious if you could give, I mean, I'm mindful of respecting people's confidentiality and privacy, but in general, what do you mean by internal pressures? So when they speak to internal pressures, they're speaking to their, the administration, like the city administration as a whole. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, and this is something I've talked about publicly because I've been very concerned about the rhetoric. Um, people vote, we have a representative democracy, people vote for pe you know, the people that represent them. What do we need to do to have better community engagement, right, so that, um, our officers understand where the community's at 
and then the community can understand where the officers are coming from. And I, I think it's a difficult time for policing nationally. I think that the grass isn't always greener. We've seen incidents in multiple Vermont communities um, that have led to a lot of negative reactions within those communities. And there's some of the same issues that have uh, occurred here. And I would also just respectfully say that I have learned a lot and I will continue to learn more. I mean, I know enough to know that I don't know enough, but at the same time, I do feel there is a legitimate conversation about certain things that do need to change in terms of, um, things that are considered to be systematic and issues of racial inequities, especially given the population. These are hard things to look at, but they do need to be looked at and they do need to be discussed. And I think going back to community engagement, finding a way to make sure that whether people like the discussions or not, they're part of the discussions because I feel at times there were certain conversations going on in the community and they were disregarded because they didn't like those discussions, didn't think they would go a certain way, but then they did. And maybe they didn't go full on the right way, right? I think there is some argument for that as well. But the point is, if, if everyone's not part of the discussion, you can't really say, how do I wanna put it? Um, can't necessarily be surprised at the outcome because when certain things were passed on the city council, there's a whole segment of the community that wasn't surprised by the outcome, but yet there's a whole nother set of part of the community that was very surprised by the outcome because they weren't part of those, those conversations, right? So we all need to be part of the conversations. Um, we discussed some ideas about community engagement. I still have them. Um, I'm back from my, now that it's fully vaxxed, I've been visiting my family, using some of my PTO, the restrictions are lifted. I'm happy and looking forward to doing some ride-alongs and also some roll calls. Um, frankly, as many as y'all let me, because I'm, I'm very interested in those. Uh, but thank you very much for your time, and thank you very much for your, your frank and open uh, information. I think it's important. Um, I've certainly been listening to it. And, um, oh, I had a question if you um, gave that, because I know the officers were interviewed for CNA, but I think this information would be helpful as part of their overall review. So you brought that up in our last, our last discussion we had at that other meeting. Uh, I immediately reached out to CNA and they have that information now. They have the entire survey, not just parts of it. Okay, great, so. thank you. Question, but a comment that I appreciate. Oh, Sorry, could I just speak closer to the mic, please? I just want to say that I appreciate the complexity of the job that you're doing in a rapidly changing environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank you for being here. Um, uh, as a bartender, I think sobering is the proper word for uh, what we just heard. And um, in, uh, I mean, while I do work for, uh, on the weekends, and I wouldn't say I necessarily need a ride along because I see what happens out, out there, um, I will make some time on the weekends to do a ride along as well. And, um, I, and I fully foresee us keep, uh, keeping this dialogue moving forward. And um, I really appreciate you guys coming here and not speaking. Thank you, commissioners. That closes out that agenda item 5.05, .05, which moves us on to the amended agenda uh, 5.06, which is a discussion on future meetings and locations. Um, I, I can answer, I can give a quick answer for this. We have this room scheduled for our next two meetings. Um, and with regards to hybrid, um, what I heard from the, uh, the clerk's office was that they are currently trying to implement that. Um, 
Um, they haven't worked out all the kinks yet, but um, with that being said, it'd probably be in our best interest uh, to keep our meetings here um, in, for the future moving forward due to the capabilities uh, for due to the IT capabilities here. And I know they're gonna try to get hybrid up and running for the city council meetings, which happened here. So I would move to keep our meetings here moving forward um, due to that. Hmm. Um, I guess I would like us to see, I, I thought one of the interesting things that Nicole had said was about the concept of trying to move the meetings in different parts of the city to give residents who live in different areas the opportunity to attend. Um, down, I mean, this is a great space, we have the technology, but downtown can be difficult for um, parking and things like that. So um, I guess maybe long term, and I know in some of the, com uh, the spaces where they have, now that the MPAs have returned live, mm -hmm. you know, so I know in some of those spaces they have the, the, they're doing hybrid meetings, so I don't know if we can utilize some of those spaces, but just, um, I guess I'd like to see us be open to it because I thought that was a very interesting comment that they had made. I mean, with that being said, I'm absolutely open to it. So, I mean, as, as I get more information about it, I'm 100% okay. open to that, but I Thank do you. know for the next two meetings though, I, I do have this space um, um, reserved for us. Okay, very good. Thank you. I don't know if there's any, uh, other further questions or comments on this? Um, I, I appreciate Commissioner Grant's comment, especially with regard to the input we've had from Nicole. Um, when I was on the school board, we experimented with rotating meetings, and one of the issues is that people don't know where it is all the time, so there's a benefit to having it in the same place. And I wonder if perhaps it might be useful to ask one of the commissioners to look into this further. And one possibility is that we have most of our meetings here but have one a year, let's say, in the north end of the city and one in the south end of the city. So uh, 10 meetings here and one each in the north and south. Uh, but I think it might just be something that you want to ask somebody to look into further. Um, because I, I do think that we use, the, obviously, for the schools, we, at school board we use the schools, and schools have good IT. They have all of the capabilities here, so the schools might be a place to do that. I, there may be some other options. So um, uh, I, I think, you know, again, I, I want to harken back to, um, you know, what we learned from NACOL, which is that part of our job is community engagement. And this is a space that I think is seen as part of city administration. Uh, it is not necessarily welcoming to a lot of people who don't feel comfortable in these kinds of spaces and that we want to be to participate. So. I think it, it's worth looking a little bit more in detail. So you mentioned we have this for the next few months. And just one other thing that, one of the things that happened to us on the school board is likely to happen to us as commissioners is that we hold our meetings on Tuesday nights, but every once in a while the city council will have special meetings and need this space and we will be, um, uh, we'll need another space. So um, again, I think it, it's good for us to think of some other alternatives and um, a plan that puts us out into the community on occasion. I second Stephanie's comments, but I also think it's very important for us to be present in the communities when we can be. I think that sends a really important message that needs to be sent right now in this context and this time. So yeah, if, uh, if anyone's willing to, I guess, explore other options. Like, like I said, I'm completely open. Um, I was just, you know me, I'm, I'm no dictator, so I'm more <laughs> I'm very much uh, open to anything. So <clears throat> and I want to um, look into uh, securing other locations, I'd be more than, more than happy <clears throat> to hear that. Are you seeking a volunteer right now? Yes, I am. <laughs> Milo is. <laughs> Thank you. Would, would you be giving us a report on that at the next meeting, Commissioner Grant? Yes, I will. Okay. Thank you. City Market South has a big meeting room, which might be a possibility in the South. Mm. Uh -huh. 
just one consideration in, in looking to do this for previous meetings. Sorry, I mean, uh, the microphone, please. <laughs> one consideration is that we generally need two spaces if we're looking for executive committee, uh, executive sessions. The Miller Center is also a good facility. Sorry, microphone again. <laughs> the, the Miller Center. Awesome. So we have uh, Mila looking into that uh, for, for next uh, meeting. Or sorry, for an update for next meeting. Um, are there any further questions or comments regarding this agenda item? I'm not hearing any. So that concludes the amended agenda of 5.06. And uh, next is agenda item 6.01, which is uh, the use of force incident report. And, um, sorry, Shannon. I'm not giving the report, but I think there was comment last time about not reading it, and so I don't know that Deputy Chief Lebrecht is, I'm I sure he can read it if <coughs> you'd prefer, but if you have questions, I think maybe he was going to talk more to that, and the reports are posted in mm -hmm. board docs. So. And I was just about to say <laughs> that uh, I sent out an email to uh, the commission and to DC Lebrecht saying that he did not need to read uh, the use of force report, seeing how it's posted on board docs. But uh, for us, for the commissioners to prepare any questions that we might have. Um, and I know I have a couple. Um, and if, so I think with that, uh, welcome DC Lebrecht. Awesome. Um, let me pull this up. I guess uh, we'll start with the first one. I don't have one for the first one, but if anyone else uh, has a question regarding the f incident number one on the use of force report, this would be the time to ask. I have a question. You know, I'm new to the tool this, so I'm trying to find my way through. But sure. I noted that the uh, the number or the, the the statistical proportion of the use of force cases seems to be like higher for persons of color than white persons, given the percentage of population that people of color are in the community. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, because it, it was confusing to me. I, I guess why, you're asking why? Well, we why? respond to people's behaviors when the use of forces happen, as, as you can see in the report. So uh, it, these were all officers called to a complaint. They weren't officers that were just out driving around and came in contact with a person. So they responded to an incident and then they responded to the behavior during it. Is there a specific one? I, you know, I guess, you know, I, I think a lot about implicit bias and those kinds of things. And I, I, I'm just wondering, okay, because I'm very new to all this. And it just really st struck me, you know, that this seemed like a much higher proportion than it ought to be in our community. And I was wondering what meaning you make of that. The only answer I can give you is the one that I just said, is that officers were called to these by someone else, uh, a community member, um, you know, stating whatever was occurring. The officers responded. When they were on scene, they encountered the person that they encountered at that time. And, you know, they, they I was hopefully, it explained in there why the force came about that, it, that was used in this, in this summary. Like, unfortunately, I, you know, I don't, want to put the entire incident in there. I mean, we can start attaching the entire thing if you like. Um, it'll be many more pages for each incident, but I tried to give a, synops a synopsis of the force that was used, the reason why the officers were there, why the force was used, and you know the outcome at the end of it. But the officer had no idea of the, the race of the person when they responded to that, to that call. I guess it might, but personally, it might be helpful for me to have the whole report go out. I don't know if anybody else wants that or not, but just to sort of get a, a bigger lay of the land. Okay, as that, that's, that's not a problem. It, uh, depending on, you know, this was a relatively um, month where there wasn't a lot of uh, incidents, but the month before was 16 pages alone for this. Just to, so I'd be more than happy to, to give those. Are there any questions with regards to incident number one on this use of force report? 
I have some overall questions, so I'll just wait. Okay. <clears throat> uh, for, in that case, uh, we'll go through them um, per, per incident, and then at the end of that, we can uh, ask general questions. Not hearing any for um, incident one. Um, for incident two, I do have one question. Um, and this is just a clarifying question. What is non-compliant handcuffing uh, and escorting? Um, so non-compliant handcuffing would be um, when the person doesn't want to put their arms behind their back and the officers actually have to put their arms behind the person's back for them. Um, and then an escort, like if someone doesn't want to, I think this one they were, uh, they didn't want to go to the car, so they had to kind of they had to push them along. They usually hold them by. It's hard to do a demonstration, but holding on to their arm and where the handcuffs are, and like had to like basically work their way, walk them to the car. Okay. A lot of times, people will push back, or they'll drop their weight, and they have to be carried. But that would be like a non-compliant escort. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. Any further? Uh, anybody have any questions with with regards to? Um, is in number two. No. Uh, if, I guess if I might, um, I wanted to make an overall comment, but I think I'll ask this question with regard to several incidents. So there were nine use of force incidents and six of them involved mental health as per your report. And that's 66.6% and it really just feeds into the discussion we had this evening about mental health, and um, for each of these, I wonder if you could uh, let us know whether you uh, reached out to professional resources like First Call or the Howard Center or Street Outreach um, to support you in these calls. Uh, yeah, the ones especially with the emergency um, evaluation ones, it usually has First Call. We actually make First Call accompany, accompany us now um, before they would come in and drop the warrant off, we're like, all right, go get them. And we're, we're, we don't do that anymore. We make them go with us, especially if they know the client so they can try to contact the client. Um, a lot of times when the client is in a house and they're, you know, not answering the door, we'll, we'll just come, we come back. We tell them, like, we're not kicking in a door. We're not going to create an exigent circumstance where we're going to put that person in harm's way or ourselves in harm's way and create that, that, incident where someone has to get hurt. And it's not always the most popular answer, I'll tell you, with, with these agencies. They expect us to kick the door in and get this person. And we are refusing to do that. We will wait until they are out on the street where we can, you know, I, I don't mean surprise them, but approach them when they're already outside. Or if the fire department goes out with them and we know that the emergency evaluation order is still in effect, that we can have contact with them where we can, two officers can walk up and each grab an arm and be like, okay, you need to come with us if we know they're going to be resistant. Um, or at least we can see them face to face and de-escalate. Um, it depends on, you know, once first call's gotten much better uh, with this and they let us know and we try to have them negotiate with, with their clients so that we can come along and bring them up to the hospital. Or sometimes if they'll, if they're compliant enough, their worker will drive them up to the hospital and we'll just follow just in case they feel like that might go um, badly. Some of these, you know, we do call the fire department because quite honestly, they can transport the person more safely than we can. When, once we have them um, and, and maybe have to put them in handcuffs, we can at least put them on a stretcher and they can be transported much better than if they're in the back of the cruiser where sometimes they'll try to hit themselves in the head or, you know, you know, inside the via, inside the cruiser, like try to harm themselves. Um, so we so we've definitely shifted and gone. We go out of our way now not to create those, egg, I can't state that enough, not to create those exigent circumstances where we, yeah, when I first started, when you had an EE warrant, you know, it was treated almost like any other warrant. But we have learned um, that this is not the answer. And, and I'll be honest with you, it's not a popular answer with some of the mental health professionals, especially if we, they have a warrant in hand. And like, that person's right behind the door. And we're like, we're not going to kick the door in or make entry into that place and the person feels, you know, we don't know what, exactly what their mental state is, but it certainly leaves them access to whatever weapons and stuff they have in the house. And then we are putting ourselves into making that exigent circumstance and putting ourselves in harm's way, creating that. And we just, we don't do that anymore. And the supervisors and myself are very aware of those situations. Thanks. So you mentioned that, that 
refers to the case where there were these emergency warrants. How about in the second complaint? Did you, given that this was a person who was, um, you've had some interaction with before around mental health issues, uh, were you able to call in Howard or First Call or Street Outreach? Um, that female. Uh, that was actually the fifth time we've dealt with that female during mm -hmm. the day. Um, yeah. And quite honestly, that she's very well known to us. In fact, you know, uh, years ago she had crashed into the Burlington Police Department in a stolen car and fled up the street and crashed. Um, the officers are very aware of. She just when she's in that state, that is probably the the um, quickest and safest method to take her into custody because she'd been escalating all day. We had actually dealt with her four other times. Street outreach had gone out with her with no luck. Those four to five other previous incidents, she didn't want any services. She had refused the outreach workers who had gone. We had basically gone around downtown um, getting calls about her actions and she was escalating and Tammy and her and her folks were out with her trying to get her services and she refused it all. So finally we had um, the assault that occurred and at that point it was easiest for us just to take her into custody. Um, so that, that would be that situation. It took me a second, I'm sorry, reading through it because I don't have the names there either. Um, I, they're not uh, in the document, but yeah, she's very well known. Okay, thanks. Can I have just one quick question, sorry. Sure. Um, can you remind me where D E area is? Oh, I'm sorry, that's the south end of the city. Uh, okay. I, I think area. E area or D, I'm sorry, D is in Dayton. E? E is the south end of the city, yes. That's and what we D call, I think you call it. And D is? D is downtown. <coughs> okay, yeah. thanks. I just, just as an observational point, I noticed that the majority of, of these happened in the south end. Yeah. So in E area. Uh -huh. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, you know, and having done quite a few of these, it's, it changes. It, it, I wish there'd uh -huh. You could say it happens always here or happens there, but it really does. It, it, I see. It's always interesting every month when I do them, like to see, like, you know, I mean, a lot of us would probably expect it would be downtown would be like uh -huh. the right. focal yeah. point, but no, I don't think in this case most of them yeah, were in the area, um, but that's just kind of the way it, it turned out. Thanks. Yeah. I have no further questions for uh, this is in two. Oh, are we still going through the individual incidents? Uh, correct. Okay, then I am going to wait till the end. <coughs> Thank you. I had a couple questions for three, but I, uh, I don't think uh, it's appropriate for public, so I'll save that for executive session. Moving on to number four. Moving on to number five. Moving on to number six. And I had a question on this one. Um, and this is a clarifying question. Was this called, uh, I didn't see it here, was this called in a dispatch? How was, uh, how was this brought up to? That, that was first call. When uh, I said the complaint in this case was first call. Okay. Yeah, um, they, they saw her downtown. We tried to, you know, we tried to you know, negotiate with her, de-escalate her. She was ramping up. She stated she was going to go home. And we're like, okay, well, maybe when she gets home, it'd be a much better place. Maybe she'd be in a better place uh, as well. So that's why they act, the officers actually let her leave and kind of followed quietly. So she got home and then re-engaged with her. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions on number six? Number seven. Number eight. And finally, number nine. Uh, floor is open for general questions.
did you want to? Oh, okay. So it's um, not necessarily a question, but rather a very deep concern that I have over a particular term that was used in um, number three. And I've seen this term before um, in one of the policies or directives. And I was concerned about it before, but there were so many other things going on. It was a kind of, um, in terms of the priorities that were being set at the time for the uh, Committee on to Review Policing Policies, it, it wasn't followed up in the way that um, I would have liked to have seen it be follow up, followed up on. And the term that I'm talking about is excited delirium. I think um, as a police commission, as the police department, and if the police department has it in policies and is using it in reports, it's probably finding its way, I, I would actually be interested in talking to the fire department. You know, is it finding its way in any of the um, reporting that they need to do? Or if, if they are in a position where they have to take someone to the hospital, are they using it in any reports? Excited delirium is, is not recognized by a lot of formal um, medical and psychiatric associations. It's actually um, a very controversial term. It's really being scrutinized as many other aspects of uh, policing are. It, has been considered to be something that has been made up, um, not implying in any way that it was made up by the Burlington Police Department, it's made up in other places and used by police departments nationally to um, what some might see as being used as an excuse to use certain use of forces in certain situations. Um, something that comes up a lot in incidents nationally where um, there have been deaths that have occurred because of use of force. Um, the term was supported by, um, you know, major company that manufactures tasers. So I would like, you know, not to, start to go into a big conversation about it right now, but really put it on our radar. Um, I would like to see it as a future agenda item. I would like to invite the, de the fire department to one of our meetings, and I, I really want to see us have a deep conversation about this term, recognize the controversy around the use of this term. Um, the fact that this term nationally has been used um, in a higher proportion against BIPOC people. And the, actually, is, it the, is incident three the only time it's used? That was the only time it's used, is it eight too? Yes. Okay, because I, I noticed it right off in, in three. But, I, I feel that we should um, I just think it's a very damaging term and I think it's a term that our police department and our fire department if they are using it as well shouldn't be using. Thank you. Can I, can I provide some context? Right. So yes please. This, my understanding is that this term is a technical medical term. There may very well be controversy surrounding the term, but it is, the, and it's interesting because we began training on what you're referring to as excited delirium probably in the mid-2000s. There is a long history with what can be classified as excited delirium, right, as far as going back um, 100 plus years um, with people who were institutionalized 
and then getting to the point where they work themselves up into such a frenzy and then they would experience sudden death. And there are documented cases of that over a very, very long period of time. It's interesting that historically, law enforcement started to see an uptick in similar situations where in the 80s when cocaine was very popular and it was used quite a bit. And that's also referred to cocaine psychosis, but it was a drug-induced, almost excited delirium that created a lot of problems for law enforcement in the 80s. When we initially started training officers on this, um, we were using the term excited delirium. There was controversy, admittedly, over the term. Some physicians said, and my understanding of it was this, is the physicians said, it is a technical medical term, and you are not medical professionals. You should not be using this term to describe people, okay? And so we changed it. In the last use of force policy, we changed it to agitated chaotic event. But you are absolutely correct that there is a much higher likelihood for a subject who encounters police and they're in circumstances like this to, to experience sudden death, right? So a lot of times they can work themselves up if, if it is chemical based or chemical induced, they would work themselves up long past where a normal person, say for example, if you were on a treadmill running as hard as you can, your brain chemistry will tell you to shut off, that you've had enough, you can't take anymore. That is not the case for some of these people. They're at very high risk for sudden death. That is exactly what we were training our officers, that they needed to step back and contain the situation, not immediately engage, stage medical professionals to try to take the person into custody and treat it as a medical event where they receive treatment as soon as possible. Officers were trained to contain it, set up, um, you know, again, like a perimeter, and then take custody of the person using the least amount of force possible, but as quickly as possible, and then get them transported to medical professionals. Our previous policy, we changed that terminology to agitated chaotic event. I wanna say Chief Murad changed it back to excited delirium because of its use as a technical medical term. Um, and so I would have to look at that a little further, but there certainly is controversy surrounding that term. And unfortunately we do encounter occasionally people who are in this condition, either, either it's chemically induced or it's just a uh, symptom of a mental health crisis that they find themselves in. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Um, I would just offer that um, it, ha when, when taking a look at a lot of systemic issues, negative systemic issues in policing, uh, yes, definitely, I acknowledge. It's been used for a very long time. And, but there's a lot of things that have been happening in policing for a very long time that people are trying to change now. And use of terms like this, it, it is better to use the terms that, that are... Um, I think what I would like to do in exploring this is to look at the description of this term, how this term has been used, because there's things that are happening nationally where Burlington is a small enough place where we can make a change, right? We can, we can say that this is something that we don't have to participate in. And eliminating um, such a controversial term, and it, and it is controversial. I mean, there's certainly articles that say it's acceptable, but I, I'm not aware of, um, you know, I, I'm going to look that up because w one of the things is it's, I don't think it's, it's not recognized by the American Medical Association, I don't believe. Um, I don't. It's also not a term in the DSM uh, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the psychology part or complement to the medical part. Because I think it's worth a discussion and some more research together. I'd, I'd just like to point out that in both the times that it was used in the reports where I took them from, it was the reasoning why the officer called for the fire department and had that person transported immediately to the hospital. And when, in both those cases, the person was actively like going after somebody else, so there really wasn't that time to set up a perimeter and try to... They were in, the, in number eight, I think it was. Yeah, uh, the guy who stripped down. Um, in number eight, um, they were trying to do that when he fixated on one of our female officers and went after her and they, they got 
and the other female in the first one was going after a male continuously and going and kept going and kept going and kept going. Um, you know, they they were concerned at that point. It was already warm out, and and they were sweating and they had you know that kind of effect going on that they wanted. At that point, they were more concerned about medical attention than anything else. And I'm not questioning no, no, that I'm per se. Uh, pushing back against you, I just wanted to just note in here, like right. where, I, where I picked it out, it wasn't mentioned earlier on, it was mentioned because of what they saw. Right. And, it and could be a better term they could use. Right, right, and it would be best, I believe, to describe the behaviors that they saw. Because you know, in excited delirium is really looked at as being manufactured, manufactured for a very specific purpose to, um, you know, when we go and look at the racial disparities of the term, especially when deaths occur, it's, and, and the way med some medical examiners use it, it's, it's just been used really inappropriately. And uh, I just think it's something that our city doesn't have to participate in and that there are other <laughs> words, other terms that are more accurate no, I don't, in I don't that matter. That is the concern. Simple, that was a simple term to use, and they're like, oh, that's what, that's what they, they died of. Yeah. Thank but you. I, but I would add that there is value in coming up with some sort of terminology to train officers to recognize this condition. So there are symptoms. I mean, you mentioned speaking to specific symptoms. So I, I agree it's a valuable conversation to have as far as whether, whether or not we want to use this term. Um, again, I would certainly would not be opposed to going back to the terminology agitated chaotic event because it's just a general description of what the officer is encountering. Um, but there are very specific symptoms that are presented with this, right? It's, it's um, disrobing when it's inappropriate. It's profuse sweating. It's pressured speech. It's really open eyes, very, very open. They, they use the term in training eight ball eyes because the eyes are so open, you can see the whites of the eyes and then, and then the pupils. Um, so there are any number of symptoms that are associated with this, um, you know, speaking incoherently. And so we train those to officers, but it's, it's, it, it has value in being captured in some sort of description, depending, you know, whatever that terminology is so that for, for training value for the officers. So they learn that this is a medical condition and to treat it like a medical condition. Um. So then we get back to it's not really, it's not why, it's, it's not accepted as a, a medical term, right? It is very controversial. And well, it's considered a medical term in some areas, but in areas where people are trying to make change and see that term as being abused, and there's many instances of abuse, and there's certain statistics that back up that abuse. It's just something we want to stay away from. And you can certainly, ch you know, train officers, and have to train officers because of all the issues that we were talking about with the drug abuse in the community, the opioid crisis, the mental health issues. They have to learn to recognize certain behaviors, right? And they have to learn to recognize uh, certain responses, uh, you know, when people um, are abusing drugs. Yes, their body's going to act in a certain way. They ha All those things are, are, are are valid, but we don't want to rely on this controversial term that has not always been used equitably just because it, it's short, sweet, and convenient, right? Uh, so that, that's my concern. Thank you. I think this is a really good conversation to have, and I can bring in some documentation on the DSM and how they kind of present it and talk about it so that we're all getting educated together and kind of thinking through how do we make sure that we take care of people who are actually in that if met state without using it as a, as a larger shield for other things. So I appreciate what you had to say. Uh, I wanted to, if I could, make a, a few comments about uh, the point that Commissioner Comerford made. And I, I realize, I want to just acknowledge once again that conversations about race are very difficult and there's tension here in Burlington about that. 
I think it, we would be remiss as commissioners, however, if we didn't note that in this use of force report, 56% of the people on whom force re, u, was used were black, uh, when they represent roughly six to seven percent of the city's population. And I think it's important for us to figure that out. Um, DC LeBrec, I appreciated your comment that your, your, your point that officers are re responding to behavior. The issue around racial disparities is, however, uh, the way that there is a differential response to the same behavior. And I don't think that we can mine that from this one month of data, but what we have seen is when the first use of force report was done on 2016, 17% of use of force subjects were black. Uh, in the report that Nancy Stetson reported, gave to us in April, I believe it was, 31% were black. So how do we make sense of that? I personally would appreciate the commitment and investment of the police department in understanding that and digging deeper into what that might be and to what extent might there be implicit bias in how people are responded to based on their race who are, however, exhibiting the same behavior. And, and I, I would welcome a partnership in that. I think we're left with, if we, if we simply leave that uninterrogated, what we're saying is that black people are becoming more and more criminal in Burlington, uh, much more so than white people in Burlington. And I'm not sure that that is an accurate assessment. And I, I think the numbers are deeply, deeply disturbing. Whatever the, is c behind it, I think it is incumbent upon us. There is such extraordinary disproportionality. I have not seen this level of disproportionality and use of force in any of the studies in any other cities I've done, seen in, in the United States. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to figure it out. And uh, whether it is mental health induced, I'm, I'm pleased to see that a number of these use of force incidents now are recorded as having a mental health component in the use of force report that Nancy Stetson gave us um, and that comes from your own data. Um, in half of all use of force incidents, officers identify the subject, uh, if the subject is white, as having a mental health episode, which would then call for certain kinds of resources and professional uh, support and so forth, whereas only roughly 25% of those who are black are identified as having a mental health episode and yet several of the incidents that we have discussed and complaints that have been very controversial, in fact, the black subject later on was in fact identified as having a mental health episode. So I'm hopeful we move more in that direction. But I, I wanna just say that I want, once again, this is, I, I know I take no pleasure in this discussion and uh, it is a hard discussion at many different levels around race, especially since, um, you know, a number of us here that are, are, are having this discussion are white. But I, I also feel like it is, we, it is morally incumbent upon us to not, to, to, to not ignore this, to dig into this and see what is, is driving this disparity and what we can do about it. Thank you for everyone's comments. Um, thank you, DC Lebrec. Uh, Chief Sullivan. Um, that concludes agenda item 6.01. Um, next is uh, agenda item 7.01, uh, accommodations. For that, I'll give it give the floor to uh, Shen. Thank you. Um, there were several that were received, so this is for the month of June, and I'll just read um, a couple of them. Some ranged from, which I'm doing a better job at tracking. Some ranged from just um, exceptional service. Um, this gentleman says when his wife called for assistance with a medical issue, and he expre expressed his um, gratitude for the support. Another family um, writes, that they had an incident with their son earlier this week and that they live out of state. Um, they were able to drive up to see him and he seems to be in a much better place. And so they're thanking the officer um, for the extra effort that she made in helping um, their family out. And then um, another one that was received was someone actually thanking the department on behalf of themselves 
that um, they had called the department a few times, uh, it says last week, um, and was intoxicated and suicidal. Um, the provided an update that they went to treatment um, and has since met with therapists and recovery coaches. Um, and he's also, I say he, but I'm actually not sure if it is, um, fortunate that um, to be in recovery and back on track and to most importantly, um, to thank the officer for their help and for the department and that um, sh uh, was treated in both situations um, with care and respect and for that I'm very grateful. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. Do you guys ever publicize those kinds of things anywhere for the general community? Um, just in this meeting and some in the annual report now. <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, the, um, the North End News or something, there should be some kind of a, there should be some positive lifting of <coughs> force publicly. And this is a public meeting, but there's not a thousand characters here, um, nor there are 35 or 40,000 that live in the city. And I think people should hear some of that, the positive stuff too. I agree. Um, I would welcome suggestions and ideas because it does seem like every time we cannot like toot our own horn, so to say, and every time we do try to do some stuff mm. like that, it does come across in that manner and, and it ends up actually being negative. So mm. I don't unfortunately know the answer to, to, to that. We would love to be able to do something like that. Um, just, I don't know if you have some suggestions maybe. I'm just wondering, I wonder if we can just put it on board docs and make it public, you know, on the agenda. I can, I can do perhaps maybe like a synopsis. Some of these people don't want to, I can't just post them. Some no. of them well, want to stand, stay an yeah. anonymous. And so if, I, if, if you think that that's feasible to do, to just summarize or caption what I can, I don't, um, I guess we're up for that as well. It's a small thing. On the other hand, small things can grow across time, and it might help some of the morale issues in small, tiny ways, which sometimes are important. I agree. As always, <laughs> I'd like to take opportunities to promote po positive public engagement. And our department, for a variety of reasons, doesn't have ongoing public engagement. And ongoing public engagement in, includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I have had someone tell me that some of my ideas are copaganda. You know, that's going to happen, right? Because we talk about some people all the way over here, some people all the way over here, but in fact, most people are here, right? So um, at some point that has to start and it includes how do we tell stories that talk about the good things that are going on in the community with regards to the police department? Um, how do we tell stories about some of the bad things that are going on but go into more detail as opposed to, um, oh my goodness, uh, it, some of the negativity that was referred to earlier, right? But how do we also tell stories and give information to the community that educates the community in terms of how they can help the police department? Because we're, we know wherever we end up with public safety, we are going to have some number of police officers. I'm so supportive of the idea of a cahoots model. I am supportive of the two other positions that we're looking at. I think that uh, this hybrid uh, um, model is really important, but at the same time, we still will need to improve how we talk to the community. Um, I, I was really uh, just dumbfounded by someone who was recently um, carjacked, and, and I guess I, it didn't meet my New York City definition of carjacking because they weren't actually in the car, but they left their car running, 
with their keys in the car. It, I don't think a lot of people really understand the crimes of opportunity that we could, could really cut down in our community because people unfortunately are careless at times. I think if people had certain numbers, um, and I think also what um, people in the community being the eyes and ears, I know there was a house in my neighborhood where people reported on, there was a lot of drug activity, and it took time for people to report what was going on in order for officers to build a case to you know, move into the people that were in, in that particular um, house. So uh, there's just none of that going on, and it's really important. So I just want to bring that up again. Um, and hopefully now that we are getting past these COVID restrictions and uh, can continue to hold on to that, maybe we can start to make some steps. And there are definitely some steps that can be taken that don't involve money. They'll involve time but and, and volunteers, but they don't involve money. And if we can show that they can work, then maybe we can go and we can get something in the budget. But um, I think the Burlington is a city that really needs to have a, a position that's managing websites. Um, we need our own web page. Um, I think the police department's web page can be uh, improved and be more user friendly. And I think that public relations is is important. And um, it, it's just it's just lacking all the way around. And um, we need to promote more communication is the bottom line. And thank you for listening to my rant again about public engagement. I have a dream. And not a rant at all. Um, so uh, that concludes uh, agenda item 7.01. Moving on to agenda item 8.01, commissioner updates or comments. And this is the point, part of the meeting where if you have uh, any comments, updates, you want to give about things you're doing, whatever, uh, commission re relevant, this is uh, your time. Meeting number two, almost completed. <laughs> All right, not hearing any. Um, so, so sorry, uh, for uh, next meeting agenda. Yes. I Could I just uh, make a comment? It may not fall into the category oh. that you want, but. Um, in working on the annual report this year, I realized there are a couple of things I think it would be beneficial to address. One is tracking commendations, and Shannon and I have talked about that, and that's great. Complaint tracking, um, I think we're working on it, but one of the areas that hopefully we can uh, talk to you about, D.C. Sullivan, is telephone complaints that are received by telephone and being able to get a written transcript of those. And so um, maybe that's something that we could work on. Uh, having the written for, uh, submitted form for complaints is really beneficial for capturing all the information, but we seem to miss some when it's a telephone complaint. So, uh, moving on to 9.01, next meeting agenda items. And um, I don't have the work plan pulled up, but um, I was going to see how we worked on that. Uh, I was have to post that uh, for next meeting, so we'll talk about that. And uh, commissioners, just uh, be in contact with me about things uh, we want to add to, uh, in addition to the, uh, the work plan. I will say the week, the week going into our meeting, I will not be available, so my hope is to have the agenda out a week and a half earlier than usual, so I'll be in contact about that. And, um, <coughs> Would you like some agenda items? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, one would be uh, Commissioner Grant's update on uh, where the commission meetings might be held. Another is that um, um, State's Attorney Sarah George will be uh, giving us a presentation on alternatives to arrest. And uh, Professor Neil Gross, who is a former police officer uh, who now is a professor at uh, sociology at Colby College, will be giving a presentation presentation on racial disparities and how to reduce those in policing. Could you repeat the, the name of that person again? Neil Gross. Thank, thank you. All right, 
right. Um, I motion that we go into executive session to discuss complaints and disciplinary matters. And at the conclusion of executive session, um, there'll be no actionable items and, we'll, and the meeting will be adjourned afterwards. So, so I, uh, yeah, so I make that motion if I can get a second. Seconded by Kevin. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 That passes unanimously.